The public can attend tonight's meeting in person at the George DeSiero City and County Buildings Council Chambers located at One Decomb Drive or watch live on Channel 8 and through live streaming on Broomfield's website. The public may also participate in public comment either in person or by calling 855-695-3744 and pressing star 3 to be placed in the queue. Please note that if you're calling in for public comment, and would like to speak on more than one item on tonight's agenda, you'll need to press star three each time to be placed back in the queue for comment. Public comment will be limited to nine minutes total per item. The first one through 15 participants will have three minutes to speak. The next 16 through 25 participants will have two minutes. And if time remains, the next 26 plus participants will have one and a half minutes to speak. Again, if joining virtually for public comment, the number is 855 695-3744 and press star three to be placed in the queue. Screeners will ask callers for their first and last name, neighborhood, and the agenda item the caller would like to speak on. Please call several minutes before the agenda item and press star three to ensure you're in the queue for comments. If joining in person, we'll ask you to come to the podium and state your name and neighborhood for the record and uh, the time limits will be as stated earlier. The City Council regular meeting is called to order. Will the clerk please call the roll? Anderson? Here. Cohen? Here. Hankel? Jazerski? Here. Leslie? Here. Lynn? Here. Lindstedt? Here. Marshall? Here. Here. Shaft? Here. Boy. Here. Thank you. Our forum is present. Will everyone please rise and join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. In an effort to keep order for tonight's meeting, I ask council members to limit their comments to five minutes. If council members are given an opportunity to speak for a second time, they should limit their comments to two minutes. The clerk will be assisting with timekeeping and council members will be able to see their time on the podium. We'll begin with council's review and approval of this evening's agenda. Council may add or remove items from the consent agenda or council may revise the order of business for the meeting. Does any member of council have any comments or questions regarding this evening's agenda? Are there any objections to this agenda being approved? Seeing none, this agenda is approved. This evening, we'd like to welcome Judge Amy Bachman, who is joining us to provide a, pre, a brief presentation regarding Brazil Municipal Court. Judge Bachman, would you please come to the podium? All right, well, good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council members. First, I just want to thank all of you for giving me this opportunity to come here tonight and give you an update on the Broomfield Municipal Court. Uh, I'm uh, really looking back. It's, it's amazing to think that it's been already a year since I was appointed as your municipal court judge. Uh, I'm happy to report that the transaction, uh, actually the transition has been very smooth and your municipal court continues to operate with a focus to serve the entire Broomfield community. Uh, with the retirement of Julie McCarthy, we have brought on a new court administrator Amy Mylander. Amy is here this evening and I wanted to have the opportunity to introduce all of you to Amy. She has been doing a fantastic job. So thank you, Amy. Uh, Amy has been instrumental in not just maintaining the processes of the municipal court, but also helping me make updates and improvements on how the Broomfield Municipal Court runs. My focus over the last year has been mainly in two areas court efficiency, and community outreach. I'd like to share with you a little bit about the developments and progress in each of those areas. We have made huge strides in the area of running an updated, more efficient municipal court here in Broomfield. In fact, we are now a model that other municipal courts are eyeing when it comes to updating their systems. 
Specifically, we have employed and expanded the BCAP programming, which was first approved and funded by council back in 2019 and 2020. BCAP is the court computer system put in place to create, document, and maintain our court files here in Broomfield. And the unique thing about BCAP is that this is a program being developed simultaneously with the court administrator, the court clerks, and the judge. Uh, the new court programming system has been key to significantly improving court efficiency. So let me give you some examples. Specifically, instead of paper tickets being entered into the court system, we are now able to have tickets electronically uploaded into the court files automatically. Additionally, we now have ePay. It used to be that citizens had to pay their tickets by either coming into court or mailing in a check. Now, individuals can resolve their traffic infractions online quickly and efficiently. With just a few clicks, you can accept a plea bargain and pay your ticket through the Broomfield Municipal Court website. Of course, if you want to come in and speak with the city attorney and or the judge, that option always remains in place. We are continuing to expand the BCAP system and are happy to announce that our goal is to be paperless in the Broomfield Municipal Court by June 1st, 2022. This means instead of maintaining paper files, all documents will now be uploaded or scanned into a paperless file. Not only does this improve efficiency, but quite frankly, it also is much more environmentally friendly. We have been working with our city attorney's office to make this transition, and they have been incredibly supportive and helpful and are embracing the court's transition to paperless files. So thank you, Nancy Rogers and your entire staff for your help with this. Uh, this uh, process will continue as we move into additional phases with our BCAP case management system, and we will continue to explore ways to improve our case management and our court efficiency. We are also implementing text reminders for court. If you get a ticket, the court will soon remind you of your upcoming court appearance via text message. I am hopeful this will reduce our failures to appear and again, help with court efficiency and community access. Now, when I took the role as your municipal judge, I indicated that I wanted to target community relations and improve and expand municipal court services for those in our community who may be dealing with issues involving mental health, substance abuse and or housing, food and employment insecurities. That continues to be my focus. With that in mind, I'm very proud to announce the development of a pilot court program here in Broomfield, which we are calling Community Connections Court. With significant support from Broomfield Health and Human Services, specifically Dan Casey and Kari Hunt and Karen Anastos, and working in conjunction with mental health partners and the Workforce Center, we have created this unique and very forward-thinking court program. This Community Connections Court is held once a month, specifically the third Thursday of every month during our morning docket. On those days, we actually have individuals from the Health and Human Services Self-Sufficiency Center, Mental Health Partners, and the Workforce Center present in court and ready to connect one-on-one -on -one with individuals to provide them with services. So instead of the court referring individuals who need assistance out to different organizations and different buildings throughout the city, we are able to meet right then and there with these individuals and hook them up with the service providers that they need to get programming, services, and individual-based assistance while in court. This means someone could apply that very same day to get an ID, uh, fill out a job application or schedule an intake for mental health treatment or crisis intervention. Although new, the response to this programming has been overwhelmingly positive. After our very first docket, we received a letter from a Community Connections Court participant. I'd like to read you a portion of that letter now. Hi, Jen. I wanted to thank you again for you and your team meeting with me a couple weeks back for the resolution of my case. I appreciate the information and help that was offered. It was not something that I was aware of or that I was expecting that day. I'm writing to follow up with you. We had discussed my needs for support and I wanted to let you know my progress. I've continued attending my emotional anonymous meetings three times a week. 
I also took your advice and completed my enrollment with Sondra Mind so that I could use my five free counseling sessions. My first one is on Wednesday. I look forward to that and I'm hoping that my therapist that I speak with will be a good fit for me. Thank you again for all of you and your services and the team members that assisted me on that day. I did not know what to expect that day, but talking to you and the three other women in that room, as well as the prosecutor and the judge, was not at all what I thought would happen. It's so nice to be part of a community that I can see is looking out for its members. Sincerely, BD. That's just one letter from one participant, but the idea is that we will continue to expand this court service and have a positive impact throughout the community. The goal of this programming is not just to impact those who have court proceedings, but also make our entire community safer by reducing recidivism and connecting individuals with needed services to help make positive changes in their life. I would invite all of you to come visit us for one of our community court proceedings so that you could see the impact that this particular court session is having on individual lives. As we expand our community connections court, we are moving forward with utilizing Broomfield Municipal Court surcharge funds to hire a navigator to assist with expanding court services. We are hopeful to have our court navigator on board within the next six months. This navigator would help connect community, community members with necessary services, regardless of whether or not they have a case within the court system. I'm also excited to announce we have partnered with the University of Colorado School of Law to provide legal aid free of charge to litigants who qualify for court appointed counsel under Supreme Court guidelines. This partnership allows for student attorneys to gain court experience while at the same time providing legal services to indigent defendants. So what's to come? Looking forward over the next year, I hope to continue to develop court efficiency programming as well as community outreach. This includes working with the Broomfield Police Department and the City Attorney's Office to develop a Broomfield-specific traffic class for youth and young drivers, expanding BCAP programming and capabilities, and utilizing the Broomfield Municipal Court surcharge to expand court services. As your judge, I am a member of several boards and associations, including the Colorado Municipal Court Judges Association, the National Municipal Court Outreach Council, and the Opiate Regional Council. I also continue to serve on Broomfield Fish Corporate Advisory Board and other boards throughout the community. It has been a busy and incredibly fulfilling year as your Municipal Court Judge. And thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to continuing to serve. Thank you very much, Judge Backman. That has been a year. It's been a busy year. Oh, it's been wonderful. A year. I love it. Um, well, are there any comments from Council? Any questions or comments, uh, Council Member Shaw? Well, thank you for being here and providing your update. It does sound like that you've had quite the busy year. So thank you for all the work uh, you and your team are doing, uh, Amy. Welcome. And uh, thank you for all of your work that you have done. Uh, this morning, I heard a, a segment on the Colorado Public Radio, and they were talking about the criminal justice system. I don't know if you heard this one, uh, but they were talking uh, particularly about the public's connection to the criminal justice system, especially with the decrease in the number of uh, jury trials. And they were saying that it's really important for that connection to be there, uh, and especially because this is one of our fundamental um, responsibilities that we have as, as American citizens is that connection of serving on jury trials, but also being, uh, you know, having more responsibility, having more awareness of what's happening uh, within the uh, court system. So uh, can you talk a little bit about how, uh, and you kind of laid out some of these ways in which we're, you know, we as citizens are connecting with our courts, but how we can, you know, kind of do that further and, and what are some ways in which, um, uh, Basically, we can kind of open those doors a little bit more so that people can kind of see what's what's happening and you know be more fully participating in the um, court system. Well, that's a great question. And you know, it, I think there's no place where there's a bigger impact on the community's perspective of the courts than the municipal court. And the reason being is because it's it's oftentimes referred to as the community court, right? Uh, many times the only contact that citizens have with the court system is through the municipal court. You know, if you get a speeding ticket, if perhaps you know you have an ordinance violation, a barking dog, and it's really important that when citizens have that contact, whether it be through jury duty or even just getting a parking ticket or a speeding ticket, that that particular contact with the courts is 
as positive as possible. I mean, no one wants to get a speeding ticket, right? But it makes a big difference when you can efficiently uh, handle your case without taking a whole day off of work or when you are greeted politely by a clerk as opposed to just another process uh, case where you're just treated um, without a, a lot of um, personalized and individualized uh, service. And so that's been our focus in Broomfield. I mean, you know, you may not want to come to court even as a juror, uh, but when you do, we want it to be as positive as possible. That's excellent. Well, and one of the first emails I got was uh, around being able to pay parking ticket or uh, speeding tickets yes. online. So that is a huge service to our citizens. And, yes. and I haven't gotten one email since uh, that system went live. So That's thank good. you again for all of your work and uh, thank you for being here tonight. Thank you. Anyone else? Yeah. Mayor Putin Jazerski. Council Member Shep, have you got any speeding tickets since this service went live? <laughs> <laughs> no. Yeah, that's why I thank you for everything you've done, Good Blackman. Um, it's been a great year. I really loved hearing about the way you've streamlined a lot of the services, particularly as mentioned with the, with, with the traffic course, you know, just making it really easy for the residents to deal with. And also bringing the, the services to the, you know, the defendants that you do see. So, you know, hopefully keeping them out of coming back to court again and providing them, you know, the necessary services to, you know, address whatever issues they have. So, um, Love what you're doing and keep up the good work. Thank you. And I will just tell you, and I know that it was something important for you in particular, council member, that we got the EPA up and going as quickly as possible. And just in the last month, we've had 271 tickets paid EPA, as opposed to them having to come into court, uh, take a day off, uh, bring in a check, and appear. So it really does make a big difference. Anyone else? Well, thank you for being here. Thank you for the wonderful, great update. And okay, keep going. It's nice to see everyone. Thank you very much. You too. Thank you, Judge Bachman. We will move to public comment next. This is an opportunity for the public to comment on matters other than those already listed on this evening's agenda. As mentioned earlier, the public may comment both in person or via phone. And if you're joining on the phone and want to be placed in the queue for comments, please call 855-695-3744 and press star three. If you're joining in person, please line up on the podium and public comments will be limited to the time outlined earlier. We'll start with in-person public comment. Um, so go ahead, Jim, sir. Thank you, Mayor. My name is uh, Richard Erickson, Ward 4. Uh, I'm happy that the mask mandates have been uh, removed. I, I was looking for the science on why it was done. So I uh, sent an email to our public health department. I, it was over two weeks ago. Jason did say he would call me if I wanted to, but I really would like to see the references for why it was removed. I'm really unsure of why they were put on in the first place. Number two, I'd like to address uh, something here that I, which was published in Johns Hopkins literature. It's called a, a literature review and meta-analysis of the effects of lockdowns on COVID mortality in the abstract, it says the following. The conclusion is that lockdowns have had little or no effect on COVID mortality. The stringency index studies find lockdowns in Europe and the United States only reduce COVID mortality by 0.2%. When I was here last time, I brought up the issue about Sweden, which did do significant lockdowns. They had a much more focused the data on Sweden shows that there's 1712 uh, deaths per million. The United States had 2,950 deaths per million as of today. And Colorado had 2,195 per million. Obviously, something's gone the wrong way. I decided to look at uh, mortality in Broomfield. Uh, this is from uh, Colorado Public Health. There's, there is a, on the average between 2017 and 2019, we had 390 people expire in Broomfield. In 2020, with the mandates, we had 515 deaths. That's 125 more than average. Out of that, there were 59 deaths. In COVID, 
There were 66 from other causes. That's a big jump in excess mortality. I believe this council needs to look at this in detail and see whether or not we can have a more focused approach if COVID comes back another time. I think it's imperative on us. I would certainly like, uh, you know, there is, I did modify this for uh, our increase in population. So just, and we basically had a 14% increase in mortality rate at Brookville under the lock, strict lockdown in 2020. Now the real question is, is this due to the lockdown measures that were instituted? Or is it something else? And that's why we have a public health department. And I would certainly like to see if they would delve into that much deeper and ascertain what we could do better next time. Because Sweden certainly did much better than Colorado and far superior to the United States. Thank you. Anyone else? I don't see any online either. So Council's community and event updates are next. Does any member of Council have an update this evening? Council member Lim. I guess. Um, the Broomfield Youth for Youth uh, group is the youth advisory group for Broomfield Communities That Care. And they are extending an invitation to teens for paid summer internships. They're seeking youth in grades eight to 12 to participate in the internship and use positive peer pressure strategies to dispel myths about marijuana use and youth and youth and educate the community about positive social norms and youth behaviors. If you're interested in this opportunity and you're in grades eight to 12, there's information on the public health uh, website under Youth for Youth and applications are due on March 31st. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Any other Council Member that update? Council Member Schaff. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, so I wanted to uh, let Council know this next uh, Monday, March 14th at 9 a.m., uh, the Rocky Mountain Metropolitan Airport Community Noise Roundtable will be meeting in person uh, at the airport as well as virtual. So if uh, that's something of interest, please attend. Uh, the other uh, two other things. Uh, one more thing is uh, the RTD uh, has their uh, system optimization plan uh, that is out uh, waiting for community feedback. Uh, that feedback period closes tomorrow, March 9th. So uh, if you do have any feedback for that uh, plan, uh, please submit that. Um, and then the last thing is One Book, One Room Fills. Uh, the community vote is now live, and uh, that will be running, I believe, through the end of the month. Um, yes, through May, uh, March 31st. So uh, there are three books that uh, the community has put out there. Uh, please read them or check out the descriptions and please vote. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Schaff, especially Honey Buzz. <laughs> I'm on the committee. I might be a little biased. Um, and I would be remiss uh, to not say happy International Women's Day to all the fighters, warriors, teachers, and caregivers who make this planet worth living on. Today is your day. Today is my day. It's the day we as humans who identify as women continue to proclaim our power on this planet, celebrate the inherent power we have and have always had. It's a day that we acknowledge that women in other parts of the world, if the world continue to live in what we have in this country, would find unbearable. We acknowledge today that we have not yet achieved equality for women pay equity, autonomy, autonomy over our bodies, recognition of our contributions, or simply put respect. And this is far worse in other parts of the world. We acknowledge and celebrate the amazing women who are fighting for us every day here and abroad. We women will win this war against women. We will because we continue to fight against sexism and the devaluing of who we are and what we do. Today is every day. Thank you. Back to the script. Council's consideration of the consent agenda is next. The clerk will read all of the consent agenda items by title, and there will be one opportunity for public comments and council questions. Council will then be asked to approve the consent agenda with two separate motions as item 70 to the request for executive session and requires an individual motion. Following the clerk's reading of consent agenda items 7A through 7E, we'll ask for public comments. 
Will the clerk please read agenda items 7A through 7E by title. 7A, approval of minutes of the February 15th, 2022 special meeting and February 22nd, 2022 regular meeting. 7B, resolution number 2022-39, authorizing and approving a first amendment of an intergovernmental agreement between the city and county of Broomfield and Colorado Department of Transportation through the 2020-2023 Transportation Improvement Program for Industrial Lane and Nickel Street, Commerce Street Intersection Operational Improvements. 7C, resolution number 2022-42, authorizing and approving a change order to Moltz Construction Inc. for construction services for the wastewater treatment plant Digester number two improvements. 70 resolution number 2022-44 appointing and reappointing associate municipal court judges. 7E request for executive session for purpose of communicating legal advice and providing instruction to negotiators related to extraction of oil and gas noise exceedances settlement agreement. Thank you. We'll now proceed with public comments. Does any member of the public have comments on these agenda items? Seeing none online, does any member of council have comments on these agenda items? Council Member Lim. On 7C, the um, additional funds that are requested amount to about 17% over the initial allocated amount, approved amount for some corroded piping that was discovered in the process of replacement. And I just wondered if that was anticipated, um, if you know, it had been exhausted in its life cycle, if that kind of was anticipated that that might happen, that we're approving a, a fair amount of money over the original amount. Director Dahl. Thank you. Um, great question. Uh, we were aware that repairs were needed to the digester number two. However, the repairs that are required are outside the initial scope. So while we provided a certain amount of money, um, just looking at the memo, we had a, an aggregate uh, change order up to 374,000 and change. Uh, the repairs that are actually needed uh, exceed that amount. So that is why we are in front of you. So um, the, the pipes are more damaged than we thought. The concrete is in worse shape than we thought. So it's basically an expansion of the scope to complete the original repair. Okay, um, thank you. Um, just to note that I guess those things happen and then that's what gets reflected in our water rate or something. I would add by when we look at these repairs, um, because repairs are one of those unforeseen things sometimes, uh, the pricing was consistent with being low bid. So we do look at that in the process as well. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other comments or questions from council? All right, before asking for a motion, I want to remind everyone that item 7C is an intergovernmental agreement and requires two thirds approval of council. Is there a motion by council that the recommendations contained in the staff reports for agenda items 7A through 7D be approved? Council Member Staff. So moved. Is there a second? Council Member Ward. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is council's consideration of consent agenda item 70, a request for an executive session. Will the city and county attorney please read the motion? Thank you, Mayor. That an executive session be held on March 29, 2022, prior to council's regular meeting for the purpose of communicating legal advice and providing instruction to negotiators related to Extraction Oil and Gas Noise Exceedances Settlement Agreement as permitted by CRS Section 246402-4B and E. Thank you. Is there a motion? Council Member Ward. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Member Marshall. Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? 
Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. There is no business before the Board of Social Services this evening. We have the COVID-19 update for the Board of Health to review this evening. The meeting of the Board of Health is called to order. I'll ask the clerk to call the roll for the Board of Health. Anderson? Here. Cohen? Here. Engel? Jazerski? Here. Leslie? Here. Lim? Here. Lindstedt? Here. Marshall? Here. Here. Schaff? Here. Ward? Here. Thank you. Quorum is present. Board members have a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mary. Good evening, Council and Community. Jason Balling, Director of Public Health, will walk us through this COVID update. It continues to look positive. Mr. Balling. Uh, thanks, Ms. Hoffman, and uh, good evening, Mayor, Mayor President, and Council members. It's my pleasure to be in front of you today and actually present some good news as far as what's going on in the uh, COVID. Uh, response. Uh, first, I do want to uh, point out or, or address uh, Dr. Anderson's um, public comments. And as you know, I view all viewpoints and data and take that into consideration. I'm happy to always talk to residents. Uh, one thing is definitely as we go through reflecting back on what we did through the COVID response, we always look at what could we have done better. And part of what we do is a formal after action report. So our department is engaged in that process right now and trying to figure out what are those lessons learned as we move forward in the COVID pandemic. Uh, the second thing uh, regarding the study that was pointed out with lockdowns, it was a meta-analysis that was done, uh, consulted with our medical officer and also with School of Public Health, Dean Samet, who's well-versed in the data. There are some concerns around the uh, methodology that was used with that meta-analysis. So, it's a study that's out there, peer reviewed, but at the same point, um, you have to look at the methodology and I'd be happy to send uh, some of that feedback to the council if you're interested. Uh, as far as where we're heading with COVID, uh, you can go to the next slide. Everything is heading in the positive, in positive direction. So as you can see, our cases have dropped dramatically and are at the lowest point since late June of 2021. Uh, we had a high of 1,445 cases of, for our seven-day incidents on January 10th. We're down to 19 on March 6th. Um, some of that might be to the, due to the fact that people are doing home tests and may not be reporting those tests. But at the same point, some of that was going on during the Omicron peak. So uh, we are looking at that and believe that this is a true reflection of where we're at. Uh, also, our percent positivity has significantly declined from a high of 27.9 to 3.2%. So we're below that 5% threshold uh, right now. Uh, the modeling data, as I was mentioning, the Colorado School of Public Health and Dean Samet released a updated report uh, in February. And one thing that was um, extremely uh, gratifying to see is that the modeling uh, data is actually following trends exactly as how they how they predicted, and part of that is they're running multiple scenarios now in that modeling data to account for all the different potential factors. Uh, they have um, increased the estimate of people they think are um, immune to Omicron, and that went up from eighty percent to ninety percent. Um, and we're seeing that play out in community transmission, either through increased vaccines, people uh, being vaccinated, or just people that were infected with Omicron have a high level of immunity in the community right now. We know that with vaccines, uh, the vaccine effectiveness decreases over time. We're still trying to figure out what that's going to look like with the third doses. Um, and what that will potentially mean for the future, waiting for the CDC and uh, NIH to come out with those recommendations. Uh, but we are in this place that we should all um, appreciate and be able to relax a little bit or be predictable over the next uh, few months and into the early summer months, assuming we don't get a uh, variant that escape, escapes uh, vaccines. Uh, so we'll have to continually watch that. Uh, the other thing that we've been moving towards and measuring is uh, 
severity, and you can see our hospitalizations drop significantly. Again, we're at our lowest point since June 2021. Uh, we had 14 Brimfield residents that were hospitalized in February. That's down, I forget the exact number, but we were uh, significantly higher than that in, in January. So the fact that we decrease so much uh, shows that that lacking measure is following case rates. Additionally, as far as the North Central region, uh, we had a high of 1,075 patients that were admitted on January 18th, and we're down to 180 on March 7th. And also our ICU capacity has now increased to over 10% to 14%. Um, we're still continuing that uh, people stay up to date on their vaccines or get vaccinated. We have seen that uh, we have hit sort of this flattening of vaccine uptake uh, in the community. Uh, one reason is that a lot of our residents are already up to date on their vaccines. We're doing better than the rest of the state and the nation with them. And then the second thing is we're at a place trying to reach those individuals that still may not have uh, been vaccinated for various reasons. So continuing to educate as much as possible. Uh, lastly, the state and the CDC are releasing guidance documents to plan for the next phases of COVID. And we use the terms living with COVID or moving to end in city or endemic phase, whichever way you want to say starting those plans, what that looks like. And so the state uh, has released a roadmap that outlines the steps and what it takes. Uh, part of it is how do we build more of this within the healthcare system? Um, uh, my uh, favorite person at the state, Scott Buckman, who's the COVID incident commander, always says, for any other thing, you wouldn't drive up to a parking lot to get a test or to get a vaccine. So how do we get this back into the normal system versus having to do that? Uh, also, how do we begin to uh, build, build out our surveillance and identification uh, systems within public health and pre prepare if there's an experience? So thankfully in Broomfield, we participate in the wastewater program. That's one of those early identification systems. And then the genomic sequencing, which the state has a very strong program here in Colorado to identify additional variants. So continuing to use those as early indicators, in addition to looking at our mitigation response. Um, and then lastly, uh, the CDC has moved uh, to also looking at severity versus community transmission in their metrics and recommendations for masks and other mitigation efforts. Just mentioned that it just follows where we're at in this pandemic and in what phase. Um, so they're looking at not only community transmission, but um, uh, hospital admissions and ICU capacity. So those things that we've been looking at as well. And, and Brimfield is in the low range according to the CDC uh, guidance. So they don't recommend mask wearing among the general public uh, individuals who may be at risk or live with uh, those that may be at risk, still encouraging them to wear highly effective masks um, uh, to protect themselves and, and those individuals. And we'll continue to do our uh, promotion of mitigation steps as we go through this um, current phase of the lull, I say in COVID, and use this opportunity to begin planning for the next phase if we do have a peak and need to respond again. And with that, that concludes my presentation and I can take questions. Thank you very much, Director Wiling. That's indeed a, a great snapshot of where we are. We'll now proceed with public comments. Does any member of the public have comments on this item? No, I guess we only have the one. Um, does any member of council have any questions or comments of the board? Council, board member Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. I had one question, but one comment I was just gonna add on to your initial statement regarding to the gentleman's comments. Um, in general, in comparison of the U.S. and Sweden in terms of health, we're going to lose. Um, Sweden is considered one of the most healthiest societies on Earth. They have a universal healthcare system. They have a diet that is much healthier than the U.S. in terms of vegetables, cold water fish, things we don't necessarily have access to. Um, so it's not really a valid comparison 
in terms of health outcomes, um, in terms of COVID, actually Sweden did much worse than its Nordic neighbors, uh, Denmark and Norway, which did do lockdowns. So the comparison the gentleman was making is not really valid on that. That compared to us in the US, where we have a much less healthy population, yes. But compared to societies very similar to their demographic and their health, um, just an example, the infant mortality rate in Sweden is less than half of the US. It's, it's an extremely healthy society. So the comparison, something that you know, Pet P covers it. This information, selective information about health, is an irritation of mine and it can lead people to make the wrong conclusions. So I don't think that's a conclusive statement. But I have uh, my one question was uh, in terms of vaccines, is there been any discussion with the schools in terms of whether COVID vaccine will be added to the list of required vaccines or heavily recommended vaccines for attending public school in the fall? Uh, excellent question, uh, Councilmember Cohen. Uh, so through state legislation, the Colorado State Board of Health is the one that gets to determine which vaccines are uh, included as far as school entry requirements. Um, I understand that there's a, a coalition that's working with the state uh, health department on what it would potentially look like if it was added as one of those required vaccines, but I'm not aware of anything that's been scheduled by the State Board of Health at this point. And my understanding is we anticipate the vaccines we have now will probably be different in terms of what's available this summer based on... Yeah, and one of the other challenges with that too is we still don't know the um, exactly what the third dose, if we need additional doses, and so one thing we need is full FDA authorization for those under age 18. And then the second thing is a better understanding of what the full primary and uh, series looks like and then additional series. Thank you. Council Member Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I just want to thank you very much for um, all your work that you've done on this. Um, I don't really have a question tonight, just wanted a general comment. Um, this has been a tough, tough time for everyone, and you've done an excellent job, with you and your staff. Um, you know, and thank you for continuing to push the vaccines. Um, you know, myself and my family, we're all vaccinated, all boosted, the ones of us that can, um, but we still just got COVID in, you know, early February, um, all of us did. And I really do think that, you know, I have type 2, I have type two diabetes, and, you know, who knows what would happen if I hadn't been vaccinated. I, my symptoms were pretty much a cold, so it was, uh, I really do think the vaccines contributed to that. So I just want to thank you for everything you've done and, and staff for your hard work. Thank you. Thank you. Any other board member? Board member Shaft. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, Mr. Bowling, thank you for being here. Thank you for giving us a, a positive uh, report today. I guess it's all up to you. But no, <laughs> um, okay. but thank you. Thank you for the positive report. Um, so you mentioned at-home tests and, uh, you know, for, for, for my household, we've used those and, and went to report them and, and reporting has been tricky uh, to do that, uh, linking up with different apps, things like that. Um, so we have failed to report ours. All of ours have been negative, uh, fortunately, but uh, that has been a, a tricky issue. Um, with the uh, kind of federal government, as well as uh, some of the, well, the state's been sending out uh, COVID uh, uh, antigen tests as well to, to residents. Um, more of those are going to be sitting probably uh, in medicine cabinets and on shelves uh, for the foreseeable future. Um, you know, it, um, and, and probably we'll start to come out uh, as cases start to go up and, and people have more uh, cold symptoms and things like that. Uh, do you, can you tell us what the shelf life of those tests are and if those are going to be good for the next six months, year, or, or how long? Yeah, um, I will have to actually go back and verify what the shelf life is because there's uh, different tests that are out there. Um, I can say though, with the at-home tests, uh, one thing that the uh, federal government and the state government is looking at is, as we move forward, you know, should those be reported through an app or to um, the state system? Uh, and the reason for that is, as we move more into an endemic phase, treating this more like other respiratory viruses. So an at-home test may be more self-diagnostic and then the individual making decisions to stay at home from work if they test positive. Um, so I think we're moving more in that direction versus reporting 
those results and doing case investigations from it. But I'll get back to you on the shelf life of those at home tests. Perfect. Thank you. Any other board member questions? Oh, there you go. Thank you, Thank you so much for the update. And the Board of Health meeting is now adjourned. The first item under council business this evening is the public hearing and council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2022-25, approving the PUD amendment in SDP for Village Cooperative. I'll now declare the public hearing open. We'll follow the city's standard public hearing procedures. First staff will present a summary of the proposal. Next, we'll have the applicant's presentation if applicable. Then we'll ask for public comment and final comments from the applicant. And finally, questions from the city council members. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask our staff to summarize. Thank you, Mayor Anna Bertanzetti, um, Director of Planning and Co-Director of Community Development will walk us through this item and Brandon Rowe, our key contact on this item is also here available for questions. Ms. Bertanzetti. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor, Mayor Pertem, and members of the council. We can have the next slide, please. The, the first application this evening is for a PUD amendment, as well as a site development plan for a 3.6 acre property at 13690 Sheridan Boulevard. So this is generally north of the northeast corner of Sheridan at 136. We can have the next slide. Um, so this site was platted originally as lot two of the Burnfield Retirement Residence Filing Number One, and is currently zoned PUD or Planned Unit Development. Next slide, please. The Burnfield Comprehensive Plan land use uh, map for this property is designated uh, for residential, and the proposed use is consistent with that designation. The long-range financial plan had assumed that the property would be developed as, as an assisted living facility consistent with the existing PUD plan for the property. Um, the proposal is for independent living units, which results in expenditures to revenues ratio being reduced from 1.0333 to 1.0331. Um, this is a projected annual revenue at build-up decrease of $56,189. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, the applicant is asking for an amendment to the PUD. That is for three general uh, reasons. The first is to allow that change in use that I mentioned from assisted living to independent senior living. The second is to revise the maximum height for this lot from 35 feet to 45.5 feet. And the third is to establish a specific parking ratio, um, a specific count um, relative to this new use. The proposal will be a cooperative living age restricted development. There are, there are um, 58 units within this development. Nine of the units are one bedrooms with the remainder as two bedroom units. There is surface parking on the southern side of the proposed community and there's also underground um, structured parking as well. A total of 107 parking spaces are provided. The applicant's proposed facility is located about 85 feet from the northern property line and 80 from the south. There is an existing private drive uh, providing access to Sheridan Boulevard. This drive is aligned with Meadowbrook Drive and provides full access to and from the site. Um, this private drive continues through the site um, and the parking lot for the facility to the south and provides access directly to 136 Avenue. The ingress egress into a, to 136 Avenue is also full access. The developer is satisfying their public land dedication requirement through a 100% cash and loan payment. That payment amount will be $356,366.03. The payment will be required prior to the first issuance of the building permit. The proposed cooperative living model is not simply a, a rental or a for sale property. In this case, individuals and families would buy into the cooperative by purchasing and owning a share of the cooperative corporation. Based on the developer's cooperative senior housing approach, if approved, there would be no physical units added to the stock of deed restricted attainable units in Burnfield, and there'd be no cash and loom collected either. Instead, the developer would be increasing the range and type of senior living choices within Broomfield, which was identified in the 2018 housing needs study. In addition, 
The applicant has no, uh, noted that membership shares have an appreciation cap up to 3% annually, which will contribute to opportunities for attainable buyers to purchase in the, uh, into the development in the future. Next slide, please. These are the applicant provided architectural renderings for the facility. The renderings depict a mixture of building materials and colors. The facility incorporates peaked roofs. There are balconies and the color palette is neutral with grays, topes, and blues and some white accents. Next slide, please. A neighborhood meeting was held for this project in May of 2021. Summary notes from that meeting were linked in the staff memorandum. A concept review was held for the proposal in July of 2021. And the Land Use Review Commission held a public hearing on January 10th of this year and voted six to zero in support of this proposal, recommending approval without conditions. To the best of staff's knowledge, all public hearing notices have been met for this requirement or for this proposal. Um, and there was a key issue identified by staff um, and that was the inconsistency with the existing PUD, thus necessity, necessitating the amendment and the inconsistency with the long range financial plan. And that uh, concludes staff's presentation on this item. Um, and the applicant is here this evening and has a presentation as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Bertzetti. Next is the applicant's presentation. Just as we ask our staff to keep their presentations brief, I ask the applicant to be concise in their presentation. Will the applicant's representative please identify themselves for the record prior to beginning? Yes, uh, good evening. My name is Andrew Schaefer. I'm with Real Estate Equities Development Company. Um, we're excited to be here this evening. Uh, I'd like to thank the mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, and all the council members for having us. And um, we'll try to make our presentation brief and open up for some questions. Next slide, please. So we're just going to talk a little bit about our company, who we are, and then we're just going to uh, visit a little bit about what cooperative housing is and how it works. Next slide, please. So our company, Real Estate Equities, uh, has been around for a long time. Our roots date back to 1972. We've developed more than 100 projects, totally more than 9,000 homes. Um, and we're an industry leader when it comes to cooperative housing. We've uh, completed 32 uh, cooperative communities that are open and occupied. We have four more that are currently under construction and six that are in an approval um, uh, process phase. Next slide, please. Uh, locations of our community include um, a lot of projects in the Midwest or upper Midwest. So Minnesota, Wisconsin, South Dakota, North Dakota, Iowa, um, Missouri, Kansas, and really about Five or six years ago, we started developing in Colorado. So we've got communities in Fort Collins, Longmont, Loveland, uh, Colorado Springs, Centennial, Lakewood. They're all open. And then we have a project under construction in Grand Junction, Colorado, and um, the community here in Broomfield that we're pursuing approvals for, and also one in Jefferson County that we're, we're working on approvals for. So we've been very busy in Colorado in the last uh, five plus years. Uh, and then we also have um, some projects in Washington State and Texas. So we are mostly in the Western part of the United States right now. Next slide, please. So what are senior cooperatives and how do they work? Uh, well, they've been around since the 1970s. Uh, the first one structured the same way we structure our cooperative. It was developed in uh, the Twin Cities area in Minneapolis, in Edina, Minnesota, actually a suburb of Minneapolis. Um, since that time in the, in the late 19 or mid 1970s, um, we're aware of about 135 cooperatives structured the same way that have been developed. A lot of them are in Minnesota and in the Midwest, uh, just because that's where the first one was and it's kind of grown from there. In a cooperative uh, members is what we refer to as people who join the cooperative and move into them. Enjoy maintenance free living in a secure setting, plus there's a lot of amenities in the cooperative that you may not find in townhomes or, or condominium type uh, communities that are similar size. Um, next slide, please. I asked staff uh, represented uh, each member uh, purchases and owns a share in the cooperative corporation. The cooperative corporation owns the property, uh, including the entire building, the land, the common areas, the furnishings within the common areas. It's all owned by the cooperative corporation. The corporation then pays the mortgage, all the property taxes, and pretty much all of the other operating expenses for the cooperative community. The members, once the community is completed uh, and they move in, 
will elect their own board of directors. Um, the board of directors will govern the community and um, really in accordance with the bylaws that are set forth. Um, they'll approve budgets, control costs, and um, make sure that the community is being governed uh, by the people who live there. Our company, Real Estate Equities Development, will continue to manage the community um, and provide staff in the building. So, we'll have a manager, a maintenance person, and a housekeeper who will um, manage the community really for the board. Next slide, please. Uh, one other more challenging discussions, and was, I think, a very good discussion with city staff um, was really about um, the affordability and the inclusionary housing policy and how we fit into that. And we, we really don't. Um, it's a unique form of housing um, that Broomfield doesn't currently have. Um, but it is, we think, very attainable for seniors. And one of the reasons we think it's attainable uh, is really there's initial share prices that the members will will pay. Um, they'll buy their shares in the cooperative community. They generally are pretty attainable for most seniors. Um, maybe not everyone, but most seniors that have owned a house uh, throughout their, their life are going to have plenty of equity in that home to purchase a share in the, in the cooperative. Um, the bylaws will control the values of those shares in the future. So there's a transfer value established in the bylaws, and that transfer value will increase 3% per year. Uh, once the building is completed, once construction is completed. And that keeps it affordable, um, attainable, I should use that term correctly, um, long term. Um, honestly, the cooperatives that we've developed, um, we've been developing them since 2004. And the older communities have the longest wait lists of people to get into them because the longer the cooperatives are around, uh, the more um, uh, competitive it is cost wise for people to get into. So I think our first cooperative. Our first cooperative we developed um, opened its doors in 2005. It's a 49 unit community in Fergus Falls, Minnesota, a small uh, town in northern Minnesota. And there's a wait list of over 50 people uh, on that list when a unit becomes available um, that they want to get in there. So it's, uh, and that's true of other communities as well. Um, also in the cooperative, uh, the monthly carrying charges or HOA, HOA fees uh, are controlled by the people who live there. So it's not owned by someone else who's gonna be looking at increasing rents to prove, to increase cash flows to some owners of the community. Um, if variable costs do go up, they can make an adjustment to their monthly carrying charges or HOA fees, um, but it's determined by the people who live there. So um, if there's a need, they may increase. If there's not a need, they will not. Um, and again, I kind of shared historically, the longer the cooperative has existed, the more um, the more affordable it gets related to other housing options, uh, and there's wait lists on all of our uh, existing communities. And I think that's the end. So right. I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much. We'll now proceed with the public comments portion. Does any member of the public have any comments on this agenda item? We'll start with the in-person first. Please step up to the podium and state your name and neighborhood for the record. Hi, uh, Dave Black. I live in Aspen Creek, uh, on Keel Creek Court. Um, so uh, I, I find it. Um, I, I've already lost the battle on the building, so I, you know, I've given up on that. Um, uh, and so I, I know who my new neighbor is going to be. Um, we didn't talk about any dollars and cents on the share price. So I'm, I'm curious as to if I was to, to uh, set something up today um, and Ask how much all in it was going to cost me per month to live there. Um, I, I'm very curious about that. Second, I'm kind of curious about what the uh, city and county's projections are for tax revenue off of the property on an annual basis. Um, so I just, I, I mean, I, I know, I, I know that we're. Uh, it seems like we're kind of carefully dancing around, you know, the actual affordability of this stuff, and so it's just kind of important that, that you know. Taxpayers in the community understand it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Anyone else? Mm. <laughs> 
Good evening. My name is Dennis Callan. My wife's name is Janet of 51 years here. I think I'm one of those elders. Uh, coincidentally, I was here approximately two years ago on another project similar to this that did not get approved. Uh, we currently live in Arvada. We anticipated it by this time that we would be citizens of Broomfield. I'm hoping that two years from now, I can make sure that that's true. Uh, we are at a stage where we need to consolidate, we need to downsize, we need to stop walking up and down stairs. Motorcycles are out. Uh, if you're lucky, you will reach this stage someday. And you will find that this type of a community, this type of a uh, setting where you are with people who are your same age or approximately, and you have a, um, I guess to answer the question, I'm a, uh, a real estate attorney, retired, a mediator for the last 20 years. This is a new and different kind of a concept, and I think that it's hard perhaps to get a hold of, but frankly, it makes a whole lot of sense for people who are reaching our stage of life and I would strongly encourage you to approve this project. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there anyone else who would like to comment? No? Okay. And we'll, we'll go. Uh, does the applicants uh, have any final comments? Did you want to address anything now? Or? Sure, I, I certainly can. Uh, city staff had shared um, with us that there might be some questions just on the pricing and exactly how it works. So I thought I would maybe just kind of cover that because that might be some of the council questions as well. So, you know, we've got uh, 58 homes uh, in the community. Um, they range in size from uh, a one bedroom uh, home that's 891 square feet uh, all the way up to a, a two bedroom plus a den uh, home that's 1,523 square feet. So there's uh, all kinds of sizes in between. I think we have maybe 15 to 18 different floor plans to choose from. Um, the pricing works as a share price uh, and then a, a monthly carrying charge or HOA fee once you move in. So the share prices um, range on the low side. Um, so the, low, the most affordable or lowest priced uh, share in the community um, is a 131,000. And on the high, the most expensive one, uh, we have uh, 252,000. So that would be the share investment um, that each member or, you know, there's all kinds of prices in between. Um, the member would the share, the member would pay that share, that'd be their investment in the Quaker Corporation. That's the amount that would go up at 3% per year. Now, in addition to that, once they move in, there's all the operating costs of the community, plus there's reserves that are set up. Um, we utilize a HUD financing program for the cooperatives. It's a HUD 213 program. It's the specific HUD program. Um, in the monthly carrying charges with all the reserves and common area utilities and a uh, portion that goes to the HUD mortgage, uh, on, the, uh, on the most affordable, lowest price home is $1,200 per month. And on the most expensive home, it is $2,300 per month. So that is the range. As part of the HUD program, we do need to income qualify people. Um, so uh, incomes required on the most affordable or lowest priced home would be 34,286. So someone would need to make, have annual income of, of 34,286 on the most expensive um, share and unit currently would be 65,714. So that would be the range of income qualification. Um, under the HUD program that would be required. Thank you. 
The questions from City Council are next. Members should limit themselves to questions during this portion. The time to introduce amendments and state positions for or against this item is later. Are there any questions from Council? Mayor Potem Jazerski. Thank you. Just a couple of quick questions on the, what is being requested here tonight. So it's my understanding we're doing, uh, changing the designation is this request from assisted living to independent living. I'm just wondering what the difference is between the two. Okay, um, so this is often used in review for the, the various levels of care, memory care, assisted care, um, independence. Independent living units would not have the same uh, or would not have cooking for someone in the unit. There would be shared dining. Um, we would expect that these residents would utilize recreation services, to utilize our public spaces. So that's why they're um, the impact to the revenues to expenditures ratio is different for them versus for the assisted living. We would expect them to utilize the library, for example. Um, there is a different impact on um, the services provided by Broomfield for residents in, in independent living versus assisted. Is the tax revenue that we get the same for, for either one of those classifications or is one considered residential and one considered commercial? Great question. It, it is different. Um, the independent would be considered residential with the assisted living um, being more uh, similar to a commercial base. So how, how do we determine what, where the line is drawn there? I guess I'm, that's where I'm a little, a little unclear. I mean, is that just someone that, is it the, the applicant that says this is independent living? Did they just make that statement or, or is there some, for some criteria that we have to, to determine whether it's one or the other? Really, the design of the units. Do each of the units have independent kitchens and living quarters, or is there um, not a functional kitchen in each unit, and instead the residents are um, in really being provided potential um, some levels of nursing care potentially, or um, shared dining services, laundry, cleaning services? Um, what other amenities are being provided? So you're right; it's not a specific. Um, exact definition. It is something that we talk to the applicants about through the application process. Okay. And then because this is going to, you know, the, the request is to go from the assisted to individual uh, independent living, this will be classified as residential. And that's why we've seen uh, roughly, I think I heard $60,000 per year um, loss of revenue. That's correct. It's just under 60000 per year. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Marshall Schiff. Thank you, Mark. Um, a couple questions. The initial share price um, of 131 to 252, is that correct? Is that something that they would be paying up front, or is it something that where they're going to mortgage it a month or may pay you a monthly fee, I guess? Yeah, so the initial share price is uh, the equity of the project, I'll call it, um, is paid up front. Um, the cooperative would, would not allow a member to a second mortgage on the property or secure a loan for it. Now, if they can get a personal loan or something like that, I guess they can do that. But other than that, the 99%, if not more, of the chair purchases are with cash equity uh, that our members are investing in the property. So the income requirements that, you're saying, that you gave us, 34 to 65, that's based on the monthly HOA fees? That is correct. Okay. Yeah. So really, the underwriting process that we go through with HUD and we submit packages to HUD for each member to make review and approve them, has two tests on it. Uh, does the, app, the cooperative member who's trying to join the cooperative, do they have the resources to pay the share? And do they have enough income once the community is completed to pay the monthly fee? So the income is based on the monthly fee. Okay. The one actually other question that's not related to the price. I noticed in the, in the memo that you're requesting 107 cars, parking spaces, but the traffic studies stated you only needed 70. Yeah, so, um, you know, in general, um, most of our members have one car, some have two, so um, they probably only need 70 some parking stalls. Um, there's a lot under the, uh, in the underground garage and under some surface spots, uh, but we want to have some extra stalls for visitors. So if people are hosting a, a gathering, we have a community room, a party room where they could host, uh, you know, 
holiday parties or get-togethers, and want to make sure there's adequate space for visitors. I guess my question in regards to that is, it's a 53% increase in parking compared to what the study says you, you needed. And I guess my question is related to affordability. If you were to build more, if you were to reduce that parking, would that allow you to build more units and thus lower the price for the existing residents? Um, I don't believe we could. I think that, uh, I'll be honest with you, one of the main concerns we've had with people who are interested in cooperative is making sure there's sufficient parking. Um, so we generally are doing at least a um, like 1.6 to 1 ratio um, at a minimum, just to make sure that there's adequate parking for the people who live there and some room for, for residents. Um, we got to be careful. We don't want uh, visitors who are very likely going to maybe be in the same age category as their friends who live there, um, but they have adequate parking. We're not trying to park a long way the way to get there. So the surface stalls um, are pretty cost effective to provide. In the underground garage is sized just based on how many units are above it. And um, I don't think there would be a huge uh, potential for savings. Okay, it's all I have right now, sir. That's all I have. All right, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lynn? Uh, yes. Um, uh, based on information that um, came from staff in regards to a question I asked, um, there the Housing Advisory Committee um, in that August meeting, um, you originally uh, had a discussion with them in August of 21 that um, you intended to provide um, units in, in uh, relation to our inclusionary housing ordinance. And uh, now you seem to be saying you cannot do that. So could you explain the evolution in time? And change of position there. Yeah, and, and it's, uh, I would not say it's a change of position. I think the challenge has been is, is how do we fall uh, within the current uh, program? And we really don't. So we, we had several iterations and really what it came down to is uh, working with city staff is we 100% wanted to comply with uh, what the desire was of the city and the ordinance. Um, it was just challenging to come up with a way that we could because of the structure of the cooperative. Um, we looked at, um, you know, is it based on who's buying in? Um, or do they have the incomes below um, 80% of uh, your immediate income? We do have a pretty high percentage of people that do because we've already income qualified at least 35 of the 58 homes. And I think approximately 25% of our members fall under, fall, you know, with enough income um, to afford to live there, but below the uh, area, eighty uh, percent area income number. So the challenge was is really trying not to, um, I'm going to say, burden the cooperative with a long term responsibility um, that they could have challenges down the road of complying with. And we, as a developer, felt strongly that we were very willing to try to certify and comply on an initial buyer basis. And there was just a challenge in coming up with that. And I think at the end of the day, I think everyone realized that this is a pretty good housing option. It meets, um, you know, the new type of housing options that are part of the part of the ordinance. So um, it's not that we wanted to change the cooperative or not comply. It's just challenging to do so. Did you discuss the cash and lieu option? I mean, I, you're describing it was difficult to dedicate the units. Yeah, I, I don't want to. Did yeah, did, did we discuss it? I think it was determined that uh, we were providing the new form of housing and that cash uh, payment. Um, honestly, it would just increase the cost of the housing. We would have to pass that on uh, as a, a cost to the project. Um, and since we're trying to keep it attainable for people, um, I think I don't speak for city staff, but I believe city staff uh, felt like the, the structure of the cooperative um, was providing um, a good option for people and one that's attainable. Okay, I'm supposed to stick to questions right now. Um, do any of your other um, village cooperatives um, in 10 other states, 42 other locations, have um, at those locations, did you encounter a municipality where they had a inclusionary housing ordinance before? Yeah, I think How did you deal with it? 
Yeah, so I can tell you that uh, we have not. Um, we have not encountered um, an inclusionary housing requirement on a project um, in any of those other communities. So it was kind of fun. It was new territory for us as well, trying to navigate it. Any other questions? Yeah, on your website, um, it looks, according to at least the marketing material, it looks like most of the units are already sold. Is that the case? Uh, that is the case. Uh, there's kind of a, a stepped process. So initially, someone will reserve a home. Um, and then the next step is uh, what's called a subscription agreement. And that's when we go through and do the income qualification and make sure that they qualify as a, they subscribe as a member to the cooperative. So. I think we have approximately 50, at least 50 of the 58 that are currently at least reserved for, reserved, if not subscribed for. And then there's probably another five people that are on a wait list if one of those 50 units, because they want a particular home type, becomes available. So there's almost like a backup list of people that are looking for specific home types. So yes, I mean, it's nearly sold out and we haven't even started, uh, obviously, gotten approval or started construction yet. Um, is, is it your goal to solely provide housing for seniors who are coming from single family homes? Because you're, you presented the fact that you're, um, you anticipate that someone's going to take the equity in the home that they're selling to buy the share in the property. So is that an implicit recognition in your model, basically, that anybody that's coming in is going to be coming from a single family home? Um, I would say, uh, no, it's not implicit. I would say, I don't know the exact percentages, but um, a reasonably high percentage of our members in our communities are coming <coughs> out of a single family home. Then there's a certain percentage of people that have already downsized out of a single family home. And, in another uh, downsizing option, whether it be a condominium or a townhome or potentially another senior rental community. So there is you know, a certain percentage that have already made a move and they're maybe not happy with it. And they want to get back into a situation where they maybe have ownership if they don't currently have ownership, or they're looking for some of the social aspects that come with the cooperative. I mean, we get the group of current members together on a monthly basis and give them updates on what's happening with project approvals. And then once it's under construction, there's monthly meetings, they get to know each other. It's, it's really becomes a, a tight knit community and there's a lot of social aspect to it. So um, it's not that they have to own a home before they move in, um, but that's the most likely source of um, the cash needed to invest the equity in the cooperative. Okay, thank you. Those are my questions. Thank you. Council Member Shaw. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So uh, uh, just some questions on the uh, the unit person themselves. So uh, I was curious, and this is a question for staff first, and then I'll, I'll go to the applicant. Uh, has staff analyzed the, uh, the unit costs uh, with the shares as well as the uh, those monthly fees to determine the affordability of these units? Um, we looked at, you know, what the what the incomes quote unquote incomes would need to be uh, to compare those to AMI for the average median income. Council Member Shaf, I'll ask if uh, Jeff Roman is available, if you can step up. Jeff Romine, Director of Economic Vitality and Finance. Um, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members. Uh, we didn't have specific numbers as we went through the conversation. It's evolved, as you can imagine, from the August uh, when they began the conversation with the Housing Advisory Committee. But as we began to move forward and try to determine a method, uh, we did think about the different approaches. I will tell you, based upon the information that's provided tonight, the one bedrooms, um, at least from if they were rental units, would fall in that 60 to 70 percent AMI level. The two bedrooms would be above um, that level for a family, too. So they would be uh, outside the affordability levels that we would look at for a 60 or 80 percent AMI 
um, facility. However, because that, that's the nature of this that, that creates a little bit of difficulty, the membership payment isn't really a down payment. It's similar to a down payment. I guess you can make an argument, but it's not a down payment. And so most of the costs are incorporated within the HOA, um, what they refer to as the HOA fees. And so we, we're, we were trying to determine how to fit this within which side of the ordinance we match up to. Um, and what we settled on as we move forward in the conversations was to be more on the for sale side. And we we're trying to understand that HOA fee and how that related to the mortgage payments of the normal, a traditional homeowner would pay. So I, I can't give you a perfectly clear answer. I wish I could just because this is a different capital model. Right. Now I appreciate that. Uh, I appreciate the complexity, but I, I guess um, if, if we were comparing this product to, say, a market rate, uh, residential unit um, rental, uh, would this be lower than that, about this on par with that, or is that still hard to determine? It would, um, as I mentioned, it would be slightly higher than the EMI levels that we would normally look for in the IHO um, for the two bedrooms. The one bedroom seemed to be within the range. Um, and so it'll depend, um, it, you know, depending on how much unit an individual will be going into. And that again would assume a one person or two person household. So if in the two bedroom there's two people going in because it is a senior housing facility, it's unlikely to be children. So it would likely be two people in a two bedroom as an example. But it's not necessarily required that way. Right. Great. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and then a question for um, the applicant. Um, so with these with these shares being bought uh, purchased up front, uh, how uh, how does a member go about uh, selling those shares in the future, and what does that look like? Are they able to share uh, sell those shares at any price they want, or how does that work? Yeah, a very good question. So um, the bylaws um, control the transfer value of those shares in the future. So the way the bylaws work is um, a member would notify the cooperative that they. Um, would like to sell their share. And then the cooperative uh, has basically first right of refusal to purchase it at the transfer value. And typically we'll orchestrate that transfer of the share, not necessarily buy it from the member. The cooperative corporation, all of our cooperatives have a wait list. And the transfer value is uh, reflected to the new buyer. The new buyer will pay the transfer value. The person that's moving out of the community would receive their initial share investment plus whatever appreciation had uh, occurred over the period of time. Um, kind of the, the nice thing about the cooperative approach to the transfer is there's 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 really no fees. It's as easy as transferring a share of stock. So um, it's done within our community and in the, in the office and our, our, our member services manager, manager of the building, completes the paperwork um, on behalf of and, Works with the buyer and the seller technically of the share and it gets facilitated that way. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, and then one more question for staff. So um, as as we look at these cash and lose, and especially with a product like this, we we have um, a product that may have uh, well, I guess initially it wouldn't have had the well, correct me if I'm wrong, it wouldn't have had the uh, public land dedication, but it would have had the units if it was residential. Um, but because it is the product. Uh, they would have the uh, housing inclusionary ordinance, but not the public education. Correct me if I'm wrong on that. Mr. Member Chef, I think you have that correct. So as, as an assisted living facility, we would not expect the residents to be utilizing the city services like the parks and open spaces. So there is no public land dedication requirement. Um, and similarly, um, I, I don't believe there would also be an inclusionary housing requirement with an assisted living facility. Looking for Jeff reminds confirmation, and he gave that. Um, and so, but with when we move to an independent living community, there is both a public land dedication and typically um, the inclusionary housing as well. Okay. Um, so with this uh, with this uh, property, uh, there isn't going to be any physical public land dedication, but there will be cash in lieu uh, that will be transferred to the. Uh, the city and county of Broomfield. Uh, is it possible to use that, uh, those funds that come in cash in lieu? Is it, uh, it, are we able to use those, say, for the housing fund instead of the public land dedication? It's currently proposed um, within this development with the site development plan um, and the improvement agreement. Um, it is specific that those funds are to be used for the public land dedication. Um, so they would need to be used for open lands. Um, 
To change that, it would take a direction from city council. That could be done through a condition of the decision made um, this evening, and it would need to direct staff that that cash and loan amount were to be changed to be for the housing fund rather than the public land dedication. Okay. And uh, I mean, I guess the, the reason I asked that is, is with, with the residential units as they are, uh, it may be you know, more beneficial to these residents for that cash and loot to go to the housing to lower those payments. But I guess that's something for my council colleagues to determine. So thank you for the information on that. Appreciate it. That's all I have, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Ward. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I guess my question, my first question is going to be for the developer. Um, you said that the monthly fees, the HOA fees, could range anywhere from 1200 to $2,200, $2,300, correct? Yeah, the, the current, I'm looking at my list here, the lowest one we have is 1200 and the highest one we have is 23 and there's all kinds of numbers in between. Okay. Um, what exactly is covered in that fee other than the HOA? Because I'm assuming the HOA is going to pay for the um, mortgage and yeah. all the services included. Correct. Law and maintenance and snow removal, et cetera. Yeah, so the so the the carrying charges or HOA fees, however you want to call them, that are paid by the members once they move in. Um, go to their operating account and the expenses that would go out would be there's a portion of it that covers the HUD insured uh, mortgage on the property. Uh, then there are all of the common area utilities, real estate taxes, uh, insurance for the community, uh, all of the maintenance and operations of the, of the community, the staff that are there, the maintenance work, you know, that's, that's pass through costs that's not even marked up, but it's pass through costs. And then in addition to that, um, there is uh, two reserves that are set up. This is in compliance with the HUD program. So there's an operating reserve uh, that's initially funded that 3% of the monthly uh, revenues go into an operating reserve. And then there's also a calculated uh, replacement reserve so that down the road, when the roof needs to be replaced or carpeting needs to be replaced, or even the appliances in people's homes, uh, everything in the, in the cooperative is maintained by the cooperative. So there's replacement reserves that are funded. So five years down the road or 10 years down the road, there would not need to be Mm -hmm. uh, an assessment to the to the members for improvements or repairs that are needed. So uh, it's kind of smart to fund it right away. So when that cost uh, needs to be incurred down the road, there's sufficient funds in place for for those. I, I cannot recall a time in any cooperative, and I'm aware of anyways, that there has been any type of serious assessment back to. Uh, the members of a cooperative uh, because of the reserves that are funded. Well, I would agree with you that those funds need to start being saved up right off the bat because those expenses can get pretty hefty when they yeah. <laughs> are a surprise. Um, now, the HUD um, mortgage, I'm assuming that's federally guaranteed by uh, the government, correct? Yes. So, HUD doesn't actually lend money, they just insure uh, the loan on the project, which um, it you know makes the financing uh, more affordable effectively. Okay. And what are you looking at roughly on the HOA fee that is specifically for the mortgage itself? Jared, I don't know the exact number, um, but it's uh, it's it's at least half um, is the mortgage amount, and it's probably a little over that. I just don't. I can't. I'm, don't have the numbers right in front of me to tell you exactly, but it's it's definitely um, I believe a little more than half of the one we're charging. The only reason I ask that is I'm assuming some of the fees that are paid to you guys as developer are for profit because you are not going to make this unless you make a profit, obviously. Right. Um, and I have no idea where your guys' um, return on investment time frame is. And I ask that only because I feel like sometimes corporations or LLCs can be a little hefty on their fee to make a quicker return on investment and maybe a lower return, on, lower profit margin would help you make that affordability guarantee to the city and county of Brookfield without actually harming the financial solvency of your company. Yeah, I can tell you the, the project is completely underwritten. 
by HUD, so there won't be any crazy developer uh, component to it. I mean, they underwrite this very tightly. They want to make sure they're not over borrowing on the project. So, um, you know, they they go through and do a full cost analysis. Um, we need to have some profit margin in these projects, or we can't be in business to develop them. So, our profit is really uh, similar to, you know, uh, to simplify it to a home builder. Uh, we're out there and we're representing, hey, we can get you into this cooperative for this price. And then we have to take all the risk of potential uh, cost overruns as a developer. So the members are insured against that. Um, we as a developer take all that risk. And then if there's anything left over at the end of the project, that would be our uh, developer fee or profit margin uh, on the project. And, um, you know, we manage the community as well we have a very reasonable management fee so we manage the community for a three percent management fee um i don't actually think we make any money on managing communities it's more of a we want to make sure they're successful long term we want to make sure we're doing it for an affordable rate for for the uh, the cooperatives and um, that's kind of the service we provide it's not really honestly a very profitable business okay um, I guess the only comment that I really have at the moment is I would, I guess, be in favor of asking for the cash in lieu of the um, open space be transferred over to the inclusionary housing. If that's how I heard the answer from um, the Spurkins and current to Councilman Schaff's question about the, talking about the public land dedication. Yeah, cash in over to the inclusionary housing. I'll let staff address that. It's a different uh because I, I don't know if I heard <laughs> I don't know if I heard this person's answer to council member Jeff's question correctly. Thank you, Council Member Board. So um the specific question of whether it could be done is, is yes, it would require council's action. So in order to um make that change, um, it would need to be a motion um, of approval with a condition that um, there be a change to the um, cash and move provided um, and it would instead be, be the housing fund rather than for public land education. Um, that would then direct staff to make sure that the uh, plans are updated prior to recordation and the subdivision improvement or the improvement agreement is also changed. Okay, thank you. Uh, next is Council Member Anderson. Thank you. Um, I just have a few questions. I'm actually surprised these weren't already. Um, <laughs> there's so many good questions. Um, where were they? Okay, so as you talk about the affordability, and it seems that the um, it seems the one bedroom units are are more affordable than the two bedroom units. I know you said there's a whole different like 50 different varieties, but how many of them fall more on that lower end, and how many fall on that higher end? Let me kind of run down my list here. So um, we, we label our unit plans um, that means. So the Ashford is the one bedroom. You only have um, three of those. That's the smallest one bedroom. And uh, those, are, like I said, uh, 1,200. And then the first uh, two bedroom uh, is an East End, and that's 1,092 square feet. And the an example of a share price on one of those would be 168,000 in 1530 a month. So there are some much lower priced two bedroom units than the, the most expensive one that's um, the largest square footage. So they, there's a bunch of them in the 1500s, there's several in the 1600s, there's several in the 1700s. So it's, it's really a good proportionate spread between the lowest price one and the highest spread price one. It's not like we just have a couple low priced units and then the rest of them are all really expensive. There's a full variety and spread between the lowest and the highest. Okay, thank you. That is helpful. All right. Um, and then is there any priority given to Broomfield residents or would they have family in Broomfield? Like, it sounds like they're pretty much already um, slated for individuals, but do you know, was it quite a few Broomfield residents that were? Um, yes. I mean, I would say, um, I don't know the exact percentage of people that are currently residing in Brookfield, um, but I do know that you know we really market to about a, a five mile radius of the site. So there, sometimes people will hear about it and they'll come from further away, but we really are targeting um, our marketing efforts on 
this exact area around the site. All right, thank you. Um, and then this, I think this question was asked by um, in the public comments was, uh, this might be more for um, Anna, but how do property taxes work on a cooperative? Is that based on the actual assessed value? Thank you, Councilmember Anderson. It's a little outside my area of expertise, um, but generally these would be taxed like a residential uh, property, similar probably to like an, I'm assuming an apartment type complex rather than a condominium since those would have individual um, deeds. So it would be more common. But it'd be more based on the like actual stuff value and not the share. Like the, the shares are lower price with the value of the unit versus. My gut is telling me yes, but um, again, it's a little outside my area of expertise. So I'm not sure if anyone else maybe Jeff from my looks like he might have the answer. Answer. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry. Um, so, uh, Mayor, Mayor Pertin, members of council, yes, it would be based upon the value of the building. And so, that what the assessor would do is value the building and then multiply it by the residential assessment rate. And that's how we go through. So, the share prices are not considered as part of the value of the building. They are more of just, as pointed out, almost like a, a pool of funds that are sitting there that's part of the membership side. It's not part of the actual building itself. Okay. Does that Thank make you. sense? Yep. Thank you. That's very helpful. And then um, another question on the um, on the, on the layout of the height and this request for the variance. Um, there was in the notes from the I think it was like a there's there was a whole list of questions and one of the answers was for the height was that there is the option of a flat roof and is that even an option at this point in time? Yeah, I mean. Um... No, we're not pursuing a flat roof. And I think um, the discussion in previous meetings has been, you know, if there was a strong, I think at the original concept meeting last summer that we had kind of a discussion about, we would like to ask for a taller building so we can accommodate a pitch roof. And that is the way the building is designed. Um, the discussion was if, if there wasn't support for a higher um, height within this amendment that we could switch the building to a flat roof. It probably get under the 35, the current 35 foot um, height limit in the current PUD. Okay, so that must be where that question came from. And then, uh, so I guess this is the, the real question is if we if we grant this, this might be a question for Anna, if we grant this 45 foot height, um, th are we, do we have a guarantee that that would still stay 85 feet from the northern property? Like how do we ensure that we don't increase the height and then the building all of a sudden is closer to the Lot line. Councilmember Anderson, the, the plans that are proposed this evening are very specific for the building architecture as well as for the site design. Um, so that building wouldn't be able to shift um, without going through some other type of review process. Okay, so we're, we're safe on that. One. Yes, okay. we're approving both building location and its height at the same time with one motion. Okay, thank you. And then I have one couple more questions here. Um, so on the on the landscaping, there's also some questions that are about the landscaping. And there's I know that it's you know that there's 63 trees and 250 shrubs. And and is there any way to kind of give a some kind of confidence that there'd be some type of berm, some trees, something just to provide privacy in that northern edge? Yeah, so we we've uh, submitted a full landscape plan uh, that's been reviewed, and I, I do think there was within the staff. Uh, presentation kind of a, a layout that kind of shows where all the plantings are. So uh, there are larger trees in uh, basically a berm component um, to screen uh, the neighboring homes. And we strategically place those based on actually where windows are located within homes. And um, our landscape engineer really worked hard on uh, doing that. So we've got a lot of trees. We really did a, a, our best as far as trying to screen um, our property from the neighboring homes. Um, and then obviously it's set back quite a ways. Uh, most of the shrubs and bushes are really around the building itself. If you look at the landscape plan, there's planting beds and uh, a lot of bushes there. Most of the trees are along the perimeter of the site to screen. Okay, yeah, I, I use that, John, thank you. And then the last question I had was on the monthly fee, which is determined by the cooperative board. Um, does that have any type of maximum cap? That's if, if the, the HOA might decide that they want to, or I guess the corporate board might decide that they want to have more services, but 
is there something that kind of keeps your <laughs> it's limited in how much of a it, it can be above the actual expenses, right? Uh, yeah, there. So there's really um, it's a it operates on a non for profit basis. So each year the cooperative board has to approve a budget and then it has to be submitted to HUD for their review, and they're going to make sure that there's nothing funny going on with the budgets as far as. And all board deciding that they're going to add some crazy amenities and services that were really the intent to the original cooperative. So I can tell you it goes through that whole review process. And um, if there's going to be any increase, HUD is going to review why and make sure that it's um, reasonable. And then they can't really do another increase until the next annual budget process. Okay, that is very really helpful. And that's all my questions. Thank you. Is that all? I'm sorry. Oh, okay. Um, any other council member questions? First round. Uh, before we go to the second round, I just wanted to clarify one thing on the you said the real estate taxes. So you, you're saying that the the monthly payment covers the property taxes. Yes, that's that's accurate. Um, you know, there would be one tax ID because it's a cooperative corporation, so there aren't individual tax IDs, and whatever uh, the taxes are on the building will be covered by the operating costs of the cooperative. So the shareholders aren't given a tax bill at the end of the year. They're no, they're not. They, okay. Obviously, tax code has changed over the years as far as individual tax deductibility of, sure. of taxes, but uh, we still do issue 10, 10 um, 98s, I think they are, for mm -hmm. uh, each member's proportionate share of the real estate taxes and any interest that's paid. So um, it seems like less and less people can use those benefits nowadays with the new tax codes, but they are issued and uh, they get their proportionate share. Wonderful, thank you for that. Uh, we're going to second round now. We'll start with uh, Council Member Lim, and you have two minutes. Uh, yes, this is a question for Mr. Romine. Um, when you said that the one bedroom fits the 60 to 70% AMI, AMI, are you considering that these people are on social security income? These aren't people who are working and making um, AMI of $100,000 in Brookfield. Council members, um, the way that the area me median income was calculated by HUD uh, and therefore um, how we receive it from CHAPA, who is the one that does it for the state of Colorado or provides the information, they do not um, separate between seniors and non seniors. And so it is the total income of the, of the individual families. Um, and so that's what that is. And just as a, a point of reference, um, it, you know, to, to kind of go there. If it were 80% AMI in 2021, a one bedroom would have been capped at 1573, and a two bedroom would be capped at 1888. So that would be the 80% the level, which is what we were in the conversation with the developers thinking about this on the for sale side, but trying to think through all these, these sides. The 60% is obviously lower. Okay, thank you. So um, I and I met the council member Hinkle wanted to speak on his slide. Yeah, I actually didn't have any questions. I just wanted to speak. I was just trying to get in line. Thank oh, you, you want to wait for um, this session? Then? Yeah, okay. thanks. Sorry. I got you. Next is council member Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. I have two additional questions one for the developers, one for staff. I'll go first. Um, so I think some of the concerns we're hearing from from us is um, it's not necessarily, for me at least, it's not necessarily the monthly payment that's the issue to me. It's the upfront cost. Um, the, what Councilmember Lynn's comment earlier, you're assuming that most of these people have the resources to pay that monthly payment. Um, and to me, if you have um, lived in a rental your entire, entire life, you know, you're not gonna have the access to resources to be able to pay that fee. <laughs> any of your other facilities, have you provided any sort of Subsidy financing, monthly payment, some sort of way to help those individuals to make to break that up over time rather than have upfront. Um, yeah, we provide. I think I want to make sure I understand. Because you said they can't mortgage, they can't take a mortgage on us. So, are you providing as the company any means of doing that? Yeah. So, are we subsidizing the share purchase, uh, or have we done any previous projects? Uh, we have not. Um, you know the. Like I said, the majority of our buyers um, are coming out of, I'd say, over half are coming out of single family homes or some other type of ownership uh, option, and they're downsizing from a home to the, to the cooperative. So we have had, not had a lot of, honestly, interest uh, for people that don't qualify. Um, 
you know, it's not like we're, we rule out a ton of uh, potential buyers just based on our structure. Um, so I guess we have, we have not needed to do that and we have not done that in the past. Thank you. And another question for staff. Um, the public land dedication that we've talked about a little bit ago, what's the amount that's being paid in this development? Um, I'm going to grab my paper just a minute. Three hundred and fifty-three thousand off the top of my head. Yeah, there's several different numbers. Two different numbers. So the three fifty-six, three sixty-six, or three. Thank you, Councilmember. It is. Uh, yes, it's just over three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. I can get that exact number, but it's over three hundred and fifty thousand. So the question I have then is, if the developer was paying the cash in lieu under the inclusionary housing ordinance, what would that be? Um, again, this varies, uh, council members, mayor. Um, this varies whether it's considered a rental or for sale. If it was a for sale and they did the 10%, then it'd be $300,000 even. If it was a rental, it'd be $364,650. Because the cash in lieu is determined whether it's a for sale or rental. So the, the amount that we're getting cash in lieu for the public lands is about the same amount as what we would get from the housing. Thank you, Council Member. Yes, that is correct. So, if we were to transfer that over, what then goes to public lands? If the entire amount were to be um, utilized for the housing fund, there would not be a public land dedication from this project. And isn't that required by ordinance to have a public land dedication? There's a requirement in the site development plan and PUD plan findings for compliance with the master plan, which is our 2016 comprehensive plan. That plan adopts the open space and trails and recreation master plan, which has that public land dedication requirement as a recommendation. So um, in compliance with the intent of that plan um, is one of the review criteria for the council to consider. Um, it wouldn't necessarily need to be a variance since it's not a codified requirement. Okay, thank you, Mary. Thank you. Council Member Lindsay. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I originally didn't have any questions um, that's moving forward, but from the discussion, I was thinking a little bit more about it. Um, and one option that a lot of seniors uh, utilize when they're struggling um, to, 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 to make, make their, their monthly bills and budgets work is a reverse mortgage. Um, and I was wondering if you're putting $250,000 up um, to, to buy one of these units, are, are you, are you, can, can you do that? Would that be? I mean, is there some way you can tap into that equity when you're living there if your financial situation changes? Um, so, could they use their shared investment and put a reverse mortgage on it? Some way to tap into that. Um, yeah. I don't think so. I mean, I, I, I'd have to give it some thought, but kind of one of the strict financing um, requirements is when. When we have a HUD insured mortgage on the property, they won't allow any secondary debt. Right. So I think a reverse mortgage would require a mortgage probably on a property. <coughs> so I, think, I don't think it would be possible to, to do that. Okay. I, I was just curious with the, the, the way a lot of seniors get to stay in, in housing now um, when, when <coughs> financial winds change. So uh, that's my only question. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Last call for questions. Council Member Schaaf. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Mayor. Just one more question. So uh, we've seen projects that have uh, had 100% affordable uh, units in them, and we, I'm sure we're going to see more projects down the road. Um, have we or would we require the addition of uh, fees according to the Housing Inclusionary Fund uh, or a unit to be dedicated to the Housing Fund uh, from those all affordable, 100% affordable um, developments? I'm sorry, Council Member Schaff, could you rephrase that? You're asking if affordable, if 100% affordable project. Correct. So if, if a development, uh, I'm trying to, it, like an academy place, I think that that's a 100% affordable units. Um, they're below the 100% AMI. I believe you, they're at least 80% AMI. So with a project like that, would we require the additional uh, cash in, you know, uh, cash funds uh, according to the housing inclusionary ordinance or would we require additional units since it's already uh, affordable you know all of the units are affordable at that point with the 100 percent affordable projects we don't also collect a cash in lieu um, they are often requesting um, the fee waivers that have already been codified um, but we don't collect an additional cash in lieu for those amounts um, and those projects um, typically um, come through with their their proposed 
um, like you said, the, the income range, the, the range of uh, affordability. Okay. Yeah, and I, I, I guess I asked that because it, it seems like that about half of this development is going to fall within that affordable unit, that 60 to 80 percent, and then the other piece is going to fall outside of that. So just trying to think about that balance. So appreciate the, comment, the answer. Thank you. All right. Any other council questions? Oh, good, seeing none. Next is Council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2022-25. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2022-25 by title. Resolution number 2022-25, approving the Broomfield Retirement Residence by lane number one, lot two, land unit development, amendment and site development plan village cooperative. Thank you. Is there a motion, Councilmember Hankel? I move that resolution number 2022-25 be adopted. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilmember Council Leslie? I second the motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Hankel? <laughs> Sorry, I was wondering where you were. You were great. <laughs> I love it. You can know my I just really appreciate this project, um, and I appreciate all of my colleagues' questions. And they're very in depth, and we have a very engaged council, and they're very intelligent and, and smart. And I have been attending a lot of our housing board meetings, um, and I've appreciated, you know, just the talk about housing and what housing looks like. And a lot of times, people think that housing looks a certain way, and uh, a lot of times, either we're either making doors or we're getting cash in lieu. And I think it's very important to understand that these are just different kinds of doors that we're talking about. Um, so just to sort of quote what was on our memo, I just want to remind uh, my colleagues that this is a cooperative ownership model and is contributing to a key need that we've had and we've identified it already. So we can't say that we have a need and then say we're not going to fill it. So in this 2018 housing needs study to diversify housing options attractive uh, to aging seniors, is also part of, of our housing uh, stock. And we need to make sure that we have a diverse housing stock. And so I am uh, for this project. I very much uh, look forward to seeing it develop. And I really look forward to having you all as group of residents one day, hopefully. Um, and our aging population really is in dire need of, of this diverse housing stock. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Marshall Shin. Thank you, Mayor. You know, with this project, I have this, there's definitely a need for this type of development. Um, you know, we, I guess, my issue with this, sorry, there's always demand for, for housing in Colorado. Everybody knows that. There's more demand about what you what we provide. Um, and that's especially true for seniors. But we significantly lack any access to affordable housing for our seniors uh, community. And my problem with with this is that the upfront cost is just unattainable for anybody other than who are, somebody who already has access to resources. That being said, we are, we have limited space left in Bloomingdale um, that's undeveloped. And to me, we should be using that space on things that actually meet the needs that we have. That we have. Um, so I believe that based on the fact that this does not meet the inclusionary housing ordinance and the needs of what I believe is the most important need in right now, I am going to. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Ward. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, even though it might seem contrary to some of the questions I asked, I will be supporting this um, proposal. I think it's a interesting concept. The concept. Uh, it's an interesting development that has occurred for a decent number of decades in other parts of the country, and I think it does help meet some of our um, housing needs, especially for our seniors. And I'm happy that you did limit it to, I think, it was 65 plus with that three three percent um, increase cap per year. Um, so because of that, um, I will be supporting this project. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Lindstedt. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I went back and forth on this one over the weekend reading the email traffic. Um, you know, I, I think I, I think the, the comparison to for sale units in our under our uh, IHO um, 
makes a lot of sense. And I think we were looking at for sale homes and you know, doing the math on if someone has $130,000 or $250,000 to put down, we'd, we'd see a lot of mortgages that are pretty low. Um, so I, I don't really, well, well, I think this is definitely needed housing. I don't really buy um, into the idea that it should be exempt from our inclusory housing ordinance. Um, our most likely demographic to become Housing and stable is our seniors who rent. I mean, people who have equity have a lot of options and our seniors who rent, um, you know, just don't. And I just, I, I, I can't separate um, that large down payment from the, the, the monthly costs, um, even though those monthly costs are relatively low. So I would definitely support this um, if it complied with the for sale um, inclusionary housing uh, number. What was that, about $300,000? I think is, is what, what, what we said. Um, I, I think it needs to comply. I just, I, I, I don't really view this differently than, than a mortgage. Um, I, I think it's actually a lot less flexible than a, a traditional mortgage in terms of financial options for, for people who live there. And, you know, a, a lot of our seniors do not have equity and they have not benefited from um, this huge housing boom and, and, and this huge increase in cost um, of housing. So, I, I think it's a great project, but I just I don't see a reason to to exempt it from the, the IHO. And um, if, if we can come forward and, and agree to that 300, I would support it tonight. But otherwise, um, I will, will not be a yes vote. So those are my comments. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other council member comment? Council member Shaw. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, there's a lot to like about this project. Um, I, you know, when I started looking at this, um, you know, from the uh, resident gardens, the EV charging stations, the uh, you know the, the you know different ideas that are that are contained within here, and and given that uh, you know for for me I've been on council uh, you know I'm in my second term, so I've seen this property come forward. I've heard discussions about this property, so I'm excited to have this property be developed. Um, this is one in which uh, there's been some ideas, uh, but nothing's really stuck, and I think that this is a this is a good uh, model uh, for this. We've had very little um, resident pushback about this, uh, especially from a very active uh, Aspen Creek neighborhood that uh, was uh, uh, very much against a, a different valve on the north side of their community. So, um, and we've had uh, residents that are in favor of this. So, um, you know, when I when I look at all of that, plus the idea that this is a, an exciting and different model, this is a different entry. Uh, and a uh, way for uh, especially seniors to remain in our community, uh, which is very important for me. I am struggling with the uh, development not adhering to the housing inclusionary ordinance. Um, and, you know, through the uh, question and answer phase, uh, it, it kind of made me think that, you know, this model falls outside of that housing inclusionary ordinance, that it's not uh, necessarily uh, contained within the purchase model, and it's not really contained within that rental model. And there's kind of a middle ground there where this uh, housing uh, model, you know, co-op model does fit. And so it kind of falls outside of that. And I, and I think that, you know, perhaps council should look closer at this ordinance and determine if this is a hole that we need to fill uh, with that ordinance and come up with a way that a co-op could fill uh, the, the requirements of the and the goals of that of that ordinance, but I don't think tonight that we should hold up this uh, project because of that. Um, I spoke about the, uh, the public land dedication cash in lieu possibly being transferred to the housing fund. Uh, you know, perhaps we can get uh, council support to split that. Uh, half of it goes into the public land dedication, and half goes into the housing fund, and that way we can kind of fill uh, two funds uh, with that and uh, potentially get council to support this tonight. So that's all the comments I have. Thank you. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Yeah, this was a somewhat of a bit tough one for me as, as well. I mean, I like the project. I think it does um, hit two two things that we're looking for in the community. One was the, the senior housing, and the other one was just sort of discussed, but maybe not um, really hit on with the it, it is a sort of a for sale project. It's not a it's not a kind of single family home, but it is. Something tangible that a person buys and it has some some worth to it, you know. And it goes up, I think you said three percent per year. So it's a safe investment, I guess, for for senior. So I think that it, it hits a couple of important things that we were looking for in our community, particularly the the for sale product. Um, totally get the the concerns that I've heard from my from my colleagues regarding the 
whether it's falling or not within our affordable housing ordinance and the lack of a, like a cash in lieu payment. I mean, that was, it's, it's a bit of a put off for me as well. Uh, but I think the one thing that may be glossed over a little bit and maybe even itself good enough to, 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 the, um, to, to my colleagues here is that, and if I'm wrong on this, someone please jump in. But the, the monthly housing, well, I guess two things. First of all, and this was Council Member Winston that sort of mentioned, that mentioned this, the, the purchase price is not much different probably than uh, if someone was buying a condo in our community. You know, for, for initial down payment to that, 1200 or 2400 probably, depending on how big the condo or the single family home would be, you know, that roughly would be the down payments that would be required. But the, the part that I think is actually a real deal for anyone buying this would be the, the monthly payments. The HOA fee, which you mentioned was 1200 to 2700 which sounds a little bit high, but it's, it's my understanding that's not just a housing thing, it also includes maintenance costs in the community, exterior maintenance. I think you mentioned interior maintenance as well, and interior appliances. And um, I'm assuming to also entertainment costs. You said it may be, I'm guessing, uh, community events that, that, that are being arranged by the HOA. Uh, other uh, trips. So I guess it's, 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 you know, if you're buying a condo or if you're buying a single family home, that payment is just the payment for that house. And all these other additional costs you know, are, are things that would have to be figured into, you know, in, in addition. And in, in, in here, that is just one, that is one price. So for the 1200 bucks, you know, if you're getting the smaller units, they're, they're getting a housing payment, but they're also getting, you know, maintenance for the year, they're getting, uh, Entertainment, but you know, I think there's a lot more to it, which which actually makes it, you know, probably a, a lot more affordable than it actually appears to be on the on the outside. So, having said all that, I think I will be supporting this, and I think it's a unique product. And um, that's all. Thanks. Thank you, Councilmember Lynn. Ah uh, yes, um, I appreciate the uh, novelty of the project. Um, for a different option for seniors. I appreciate the um, use of the uh, land available there um, for a use related to seniors. Um, I do not see this as affordable with the upfront costs. Um, and um, I, you know, I looked some data, the average 65 to 74 year old has a mean savings of $57,670 in the United States. I'm probably a little higher in Greenfield, but again, we're back to the only people who could afford to live here are people who already own a substantial senior uh, single family home in Broomfield. Um, and the average social security benefit is about $1,700 as of January. Um, you can't get that you're using your entire social security benefit, the average person for the um, monthly fee. Mm -hmm. it, it just doesn't seem affordable to me. And if it's not going to be affordable, then I think it should adhere to the inclusionary housing ordinance. So I will be a no on this. Thank you. Councilmember Ward. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I motion to um, amend what's on the table to um, transfer <coughs> as a condition of approval of this um, ordinance, transfer the uh, PLD land dedication to the inclusionary housing um, fund. All right, so Councilmember Ward has made an amendment on the floor that requires a two-third majority to be considered. So we'll take the, say that again. Oh, and the second. Okay, got that. Okay, so, <laughs> thank you. These are rare. Uh, so now we'll take a vote um, for the two-third majority to approve this amendment. I, actually, Mayor, if I could jump in. This, this vote right now is just to introduce it. Yes. Um, then if it passes this two, this, um, super two thirds vote, then you can discuss it. Wonderful. All right. Well, the clerk is <laughs> on. Anderson. 
Yes. Filling? No. Hinkle? Yes. Jazerski? No. Leslie? Yes. Lim? Yes. Lindstedt? Yes. Marshall? Shin? No. Shaft? Yes. Ward? Yes. That passed in seven to three. So now, Mayor, now council can discuss the merits of that, and that needs to be approved by a majority. All right, can, uh, we'll go to Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. I'm confused by this. So this was sort of brought up at the last second, and we don't know the implications of uh, what is being requested here. We don't know what the needs are of our of our uh, open space funds versus the needs of our our housing um, our housing the affordable housing funds. So this is kind of a, a knee-jerk reaction that's brought up at the last second without any any uh, input from, from staff or anything else as to whether this is a good idea. So I'm, I'm against it basically for that reason um, alone. I just don't know why or if this is a good idea. I mean, it's, 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 it's quick, it's knee-jerk, and I would want to know why we would take the funds from the open space and, and put it to the affordable housing fund. I just don't understand. Thank you. Council Member Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. I also will speak against this. Um, I understand the, the sentiment behind it, but it's an impulse. And I don't believe we should govern by impulse. I think it, any kind of change of this nature deserves study. Uh, we should follow the ordinance as they are. I understand people are not happy that this particular project does not apply to the um, affordable housing ordinance, then change the ordinance. Um, it does apply to the PLD. We have a long-standing policy of land cash and move instead in place of a land dedication. This particular property would be very difficult to do the land dedication. I'm going very high in story height, so it's a reasonable application. So I would urge the council to reject that. I understand the sentiment that this is not the way to do it. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Lindstedt. Thank you, Mayor. Um, unfortunately, uh, we got information pretty late um, on, over email. I was going to submit an, uh, an amendment ahead of time, but I missed my deadline um, to require the, the this development to um, to follow the IHO um, and to, to 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 continue paying for the open space. So um, that's why I supported this tonight. Um, but I mean, I, I maybe. Uh, I, I would support a substitute motion, maybe if a member wants to 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 to, to reverse that and, and add on that B. But there's no way the the, the IHO fee. But there's just no way I'm gonna, I'm going to pass this without uh, three hundred thousand dollars going to um, our inclusionary housing fund. So um, I'll be a yes on this on this motion if it's what ultimately comes forward. But um, you know we got information late, and I, I think you know that's that's. You know, kind of, kind of part of the problem. So, thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilmember Marshall. Should... Thank you, Mayor. Um, I am opposed to this motion. Um, I, I understand, that, like Liz Bailey said, I understand the sentiment behind it, but I don't think that this particular proposal should be exempt from that inclusionary housing ordinance um, at all. And I think the funds need to go to both that and to the um, public land dedication. And if there was a way to did offer an amendment to condition the whole thing on adding the inclusive housing. I probably would move that forward. I don't know if that we can do that or not, but right. well, it's the same uh, rule as Council Member Ward's amendments that are presented on the. Um, would we have to vote on Council Member Ward's amendment first? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Council Member Leslie. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I agree with. Uh, Council Member uh, Jarosky, because I, I voted yes for us to discuss this, but I, I, I don't think we should be acting uh, off the cuff like this. Uh, I think there are consequences to uh, whatever decisions we make. Um, this is an unusual project for us, uh, not necessarily an unusual project across the nation, but it's certainly not one we've discussed before. I would rather us take a thoughtful approach to um, whether we want to assign funds to anything else, uh, because once we open that door, we're opening it for everything else. And I don't know that that's exactly what we want. So my recommendation would be support the project. There, there are elements of affordability in this project for certain uh, members of our community. 
Um, it's certainly much less expensive than buying a new house here in Broomfield. And as the gentleman who spoke from Aurora indicated, this is an opportunity for them to downsize further, to be able to afford to be able to do that in a lovely community, one we're all very proud of. But I think we're putting some barriers in front of the project that are unnecessary. I do think the issue is worth further discussion, but not to try to resolve something on that tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Anderson. Thank you, and I'm similar to um, Councilmember Leslie. I wanted to open the floor to be able to discuss it, and I would love to hear from staff their thoughts on this, because I, I am, we are doing this at the last minute. I wanna make sure we're not, we're taking away from open space, so. Um, I, <laughs> from, a, from a staff perspective, anything that is done on the fly um, makes it extremely difficult to have a structure moving forward. Um, and I'm going to conclude my statement there. <laughs> <laughs> that is helpful and that helps me with my decision. Thank you. I couldn't agree more. We've, we've made this mistake before by not uh, vetting um, and really doing a deep dive on how this impacts other things. And I, I don't recommend making these decisions without further research. And I think our open space and trail director should have a say. Um, but that being said, we, um, we will now vote on the um, proposed amendment. Okay, so all in favor of moving the PLD funds to the housing fund? Um, in favor? Say aye. Oh, not aye. All in favor? Opposed? Okay, hands down. Was it unanimous? I think it was. Awesome. Thanks, y'all. And uh, Councilmember Marshall should. Mayor, I'd like to offer an amendment to condition the approval of the um, original referendum on uh, the inclusion of the 300,000 or whatever the staff determines is appropriate um, fee for the inclusionary housing ordinance. That, I don't know if that, for sale. Yeah, I, don't know if I said that right, but. Mayor, can I have a, can I have a minute with um... Ms. Burton Zetti and Mr. Romine, and we can figure out a, a proper words sure. for that proposed amendment. Thank you. Mayor, can we take a break? Um, oh. um, we'll okay. Group after. You want to do a 10 minute? That'd be great. Thank okay, you. we'll be back at 822. Thank you.
So are we. Mayor, if I, um, if I may. Yes. Um, I'd like the, uh, to ask the, the developer to step to the mic quickly and give him an opportunity to kind of uh, lay out the accommodation. Yes, and you know, I apologize if we didn't present very well earlier tonight. Um, you know, in, in an effort to move the project forward with an approval, um, I, I do feel like the project probably meets some level of affordability component. I, I think we struggled with displaying that. Um, and I do think some of our more uh, price effective units might fall into a category. We'd like to work with city staff potentially on that in the future. But in an effort to move the project forward tonight, potentially, we would be willing to, um, you know, if an amendment was made uh, to the resolution, we would be willing to agree to a three hundred thousand uh, dollar payment in lieu uh, of compliance. I think that's the correct terminology, payment in lieu, um, with the idea that we might want to come back to council in the future to maybe amend that if we can display or work with city staff over the next couple months before we want to break ground on full permit on the project. So we would be. Um, willing to do that and try to get the project approved tonight so we can kind of move forward with the next steps. Thank you. Thank you very much. So would you like to make that amendment? I move that we condition the approval of the um, PID on the payment of a, a $300,000 cash in lieu, including our housing payment. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Member Ward? Second. All in favor to discuss the amendment? Any opposed? All right, unanimously, now we'll open up discussion on this amendment. Council Member Leslie? I thought that was very nice, gesture on your part. Uh, try to get this moving and, and done. I'm still concerned about one-offs, but since you have made this initiative of your own hands, um, I can support uh, this this action. But I do recommend to the council that we take a more deep dive, kind of following up on the retreat we had this past weekend on these kinds of code issues. Uh, I think they're very important for our future. I know what our general intent is. Again, we generally agree among ourselves about what we want, um, but it, it it disturbs me a little bit that we would try to hold hostage a little bit, you know, folks who are trying to do their best to uh, get um, uh, a diverse uh, range of, of housing that we want that we need in this in this community. So um, I just want to congratulate you. I said earlier I like the project. Um, I do think it, it fits a, a, a need. Being a senior myself. I'm more aware and sensitive, uh, perhaps, uh, than I might have been 20, 30 years ago. Um, but at the same time, um, I want council to be more deliberate about how we want to try to resolve the issues of affordability at the same time when we need a variety of stock that other people who don't have that need would still find very attractive. So I want to just commend you for making that, that, that effort. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Any other council member comments? Council member Hankel. Thank you. So you're saying 300,000 towards housing. Is that correct? Because I don't remember you saying that up there. Yeah, I guess um, there was no discussion about the land dedication. I mean, that, that is already in the uh, resolution. So what we're saying is we would agree, we, we can agree to an amendment that we may want to come back because of this, but just in an effort to get the project approved tonight and moving forward in the right direction towards uh, construction this year. Um, basically a 300,000 in in the lieu on the inclusionary housing. Component. In addition to the land. Right. In addition, correct. Okay. And so um, staff, what would that look like as far as language goes the next time we see this? So the hope is that if it, it that they are that they don't have to come with the when they pull the building permit they don't need to come with a three hundred thousand dollar check they're willing to do that worst case scenario what they're hoping to do is through the various 
accumulation of units that they're able to offset that 300,000. So the modification is worst case scenario, they're gonna deliver a check. My guess is that is not what all of us are going to work towards. Um, but the various stock is going to allow them to meet some of that affordable housing to where it's not a full cash loop. Correct? See, and this, this is the danger of, of, of on the fly. On the fly. On the fly. Yes, please. You know, just, just to kind of add to this, I, I think, you know, whether or not we can have a deed restriction on the property is something I have to go revisit with our attorney. And I think that's going to be the underlying issue. Um, that's what we kind of ran into. We had a lot of really good discussions with city staff uh, about how to comply with this. Uh, the challenge is putting a long-term deed restriction, if it's considered a rental, um, could cause problems. And we're not sure that HUD would allow it because there needs to be the flexibility of the association fees or carry charges going up in the future of cost rise. And um, having a the first the for sale approach deed restriction is also really challenging because of the type of housing this is. So I think that if you looked at this project and you looked at, okay, there's share prices of $131,000, um, um, there's 137, 137, 160, 165. Um, there's a lot of them that are on the lower tier of the range that I gave you guys. If you looked at those and you're trying to compare that to what would, what would the first sale equivalent of that be, it, it, they may fall within um, your affordable housing um, you know, guidelines. So I think we might have homes that qualify. It's just, we're having a tough time proving that because of the type of housing we have. So, you know, I would like the opportunity, I'd love to get the project approved tonight so we can move forward. I would like the opportunity to visit with city staff to figure out if we can come back for some potential adjustment on this uh, in the future. Um, and that's, you know, effectively, uh, how we would like, love to move forward. So we think that this would be a great project uh, for the city of Rupert. Um, if I can add too, you mentioned earlier that you know the um, tenants or, or uh, owners would have to be income qualified in the thirty-four thousand to sixty-five thousand income range. Well, that's about thirty to sixty percent AMI. So you have to figure how many of those units are going to be offered to people in that that price range, and that does fit in our inclusionary housing. Yeah, and you know, so um, when, when we were visiting with city staff, um, we looked at it and I think 25% of our current uh, applicants fall into the income qualification group. So, I mean, I think this is, an, this is a project that is pretty attainable, but it's not fitting the current mold of, of the ordinance. And um, we'll try to figure out if there's another way to adjust it, but if we can get the project approved tonight, we would be Helpful to move this forward. And if you um, and if you were to add that, you know, let's say it is the full three hundred thousand, I, I just have really concerns. Like you had mentioned before, that you might be adding that to their costs already, and their costs already are making it, you know, it's something that they've designed to to create, you know, in their lives that they want to search for something. Because in the Broadlands, you can't really find something like this, and this is actually cheaper than we, we would find in the Broadlands. So I think a lot of times, I don't think you think about also affordability for certain people as being relative uh, to the market. That's my biggest concern with this um, and that it's it's sort of done haphazardly today, but I'm willing to listen to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Captain Member Ward. Uh, thank you, Mayor. I think the issue with regards to affordability is not the monthly price that's being paid for the fee. It's that upfront cost of 100 something thousand to 200 something thousand dollars that cannot be mortgaged. And that I think is one of the key issues in regards to affordability because not everyone has, based on life circumstances, that kind of money to just plop down on a share for this type of development. And I know we mentioned, you know, that $300,000 is going to be. If that's what ends up happening is passed on to your um, owners and the people who buy the shares, 
I want you to want to propose this circumstance. There's roughly 59 units being developed. That 300,000 dollars um, distributed across those three of them. One time payment is roughly a little over five thousand dollars. And when you compare that to the astronomical increases in home values, many people are going to have that five extra five thousand dollars to help offset those who do not have that kind of funding to get housing in room people. So that's all I want to really point out when I make that comment. All right, thank you. Council Member Cohen. Thank you, Mayor. I will confess I'm having trouble understanding what's being proposed. I'm hearing a lot of hope and maybe and will be and we'll see. And I'm, what's the exact wording we're talking about? Because it sounds very speculative. Developers willing to come with $300,000 for a cash in lieu payment if they are unable to meet all or a portion of that and what they're already planning to provide. So I think part of it, again, it gets back to that deed restricted. It also gets back to um, part, part and parcel of the conversation that we, at the, at, that we, we had at the retreat with regards to affordable housing and all of the other components that we're looking for in every single residential development. So if it's across the board that this, this is what needs to happen, we need to make these decisions on the front end, um, not in the middle end or on the back end. And, and we also need to have um, the approach of, are we targeting populations or is population second? So is plus 65 second to the overall affordable housing inclusionary housing ordinance? Um, those are future conversations that we're going to have, but tonight, in order to move the project, you have a commitment from the developer saying, again, I'm, I'm, no one has $300,000 in, 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 in a checking account, so I'm, I'm working under the assumption, which is never a good thing on the spot, um, that they're confident they are going to be able to, through the mix of various one bedroom, two bedroom that they are going to have available will fit into that AMI category, which will then fit into the hybrid of our inclusionary housing ordinance between for sale at 20%, or uh, I'm sorry, 10%. So during the staff analysis of this proposal since the conception over six months ago, the determination made that this project did not fit within the IHO, right? Correct. Based on based on the strict interpretation, that that is correct. Because again, because of that, um, Councilmember Cohen, the the hybrid nature, um, it wasn't it wasn't a matrix. Right. I guess my understanding now, our expectation is that the developer will make the PLD as required by ordinance, and then might configure the housing in order to make another $300,000 payment to the city. Correct, hopefully, instead of a cash payment, it will be in the units. Right. And, and they, will, they will be able to, divide, to, to deliver the units and not the cash and loop payment. But if they can't, they're, they're, they're contributing. But the, in, the effect of that is that there will be more higher cost units as part of the mix. There'll be perhaps a few more at the lower end, but more of them will be at a higher price as a result. The, so, so Unless again, they just want to give us three hundred thousand dollars extra out of the goodness. No, and, the, and and so that's so so these. The sticking point is on the inclusionary housing ordinance. It's the deed restricted. So, so we don't we don't talk about that on the back end, right? It's just the dollar amounts for the cash in lieu or providing those units. The sticking point for this one is being able to provide under the inclusionary housing ordinance, not just the cost per unit, but the deed restriction. So they need some due diligence to be able to go back to say, 
what does that look so straight across the board increasing units on some it gets back to that pass through cost so again part of what we talked about anytime you have affordable units it's costly it costs us it costs the developer it costs the people moving in i guess i would say i feel like we're doing this in the back of a napkin um and as a result you get unintended consequences um i understand my colleagues are upset that there wasn't affordability but to me it, they followed they came with a proposal followed the rules we're given a decision from the city staff this is what it was and i feel like we're doing 11th hour um, wish listing that may not result in what we think we're getting um so i think going forward i just repeat if there's a problem with the iho let's fix the iho so that future proposals that, that and we can truly say we'll get affordable housing out of it because in the, the unintended consequence here is we may end up getting a few more slightly affordable and a lot more expensive units as a result um because we haven't really studied it we're doing this um on the fly which uh, never feels good so I, I think I understand the sentiment, but I think we should be to follow up Councilmember Leslie's comment, um, be more measured and thoughtful, and we'll get to next time for future developments. But I think they followed what they were asked to do, what we asked them of it, and they, I don't think they should hit eleventh hour change of rules. Thank you, Councilmember Marshall. Thank you, Mayor. One question for staff on. Um, my motion is that they pay the inclusionary housing uh, fee. Um, and you're saying that if they meet certain requirements, they won't have to pay the entire thing, right? They so they either so so just so again, just to be just, right. <laughs> just to be really clear. So two things. So again, this is this is this this is legislating on the fly. Never a good idea. If council show chooses, we can go to the original motion that's on the floor to approve this project as it is. With, with the public land dedication intact, and you make a decision on this project based on the face. I guess my question is, when you're, when you're determining whether or not they have to pay the full 300000 are you taking into consideration just the monthly cost or the upfront cost too? That's why we don't do these things on the fly. So, uh, okay, I guess my my comment is going to be that I completely agree with my colleagues that we don't should do this stuff on the fly. The problem I have with that statement, though, is for many of us, this is the first time we're seeing this project, and the upfront cost, none of us knew what that was until this meeting tonight. That is something that should have we should have had in the memo up front. The developer should be on top of that. My problem with this project is not the cash and lose, not any of that. It's the fact that the upfront cost is not affordable. And so I'm obviously going to vote for my amendment, but yeah, well, that's it. Thank you. Mayor Burkett. Thank you. I don't want to prolong this discussion too much. I do uh, concur with the comments from Council Member Cohen and Leslie down at the far end of the dais. The only question I have is are we absolutely sure that the people that would be purchasing into this couldn't finance it if they wanted to? Because I, I bet. It's not a mortgage, but it's my understanding that there are programs out there that may allow for financing. So similar to a mortgage. Yeah, go ahead. So um, is there a way to finance the share purchase? Correct, that's the question. Um, I would say yes, but it's very challenging. I know of one bank that does it and it's National Co-op Bank. Um, they're based out of Virginia. Uh, we've actually done projects and worked with National Co-op Bank in the past. Uh, we've explored the option. Um, to be honest, it just never has worked out. Usually, um, that additional cost of now having a mortgage payment on top of the monthly fee in the cooperative makes it more challenging for someone um, to, to make financial sense of it. Um, so that's why, you know, there, there are other cooperatives out there. I know there was one in, in front of this council maybe a year or two, several years ago, uh, that, that structure their cooperatives a little differently. People could put more down, they could put less down. We keep it simple. 
we, we try to have one share price um, for a unit and they, you can't change and it. it's controlled in the future because we think that makes more sense long term for the cooperative. Um, the the financeability of the of the share purchase is possible. It's just I'll be honest with you, I don't think we've we've done um, thirty two projects that are occupied. And I don't think we've ever had one finance. Okay. Just just to be very honest. Appreciate the honesty. Thank you. Councilmember Schaaf. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So um, I, I appreciate uh, trying to get you a yes, and, and potentially it's uh, unanimous. Uh, but I do worry about the um, the unintended consequences. We've been here before. Um, so I, I, um, I, like I said, I appreciate it, and I appreciate my council colleagues uh, um, looking for a way to get to yes. Uh, but I think that this is. Uh, not the way to do it, so I won't be supporting this amendment. Councilman Malinskat. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, at the end of the day, we are approving a change of use, um, and I was fully prepared to come in tonight and vote no, um, because I did not think this followed the spirit of the IHO, and the entire reason we passed that was to redistribute costs to the, 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 the uh, least likely among us to, to afford housing. So um, I was fully willing to do that or delay it. And I sincerely appreciate the developer coming up with uh, the, the idea to, to, to pay that $300,000 or you know, come up with uh, whatever the unit um, difference is in those costs. So I appreciate it. Um, and um, I, 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 I will support it um, tonight. And I do think we need to update that that the uh, ordinance, but um, end of the day, I think all the housing in Broomfield needs to follow the spirit of, of what this council um, tried to do uh, by passing the IHO. So, thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Council Member Lim? Uh, yes, I agree with everything Council Member Linstead just said. Um, there are in the, in, in the um, inclusionary housing ordinance, um, there are shared costs that get spread out for the benefit of those who can't otherwise afford housing. That's the whole premise of the ordinance. And um, I agree, I asked, I was the first one who started asking questions. It was quasi-judicial, but I started asking questions um, last week and um, I knew there was a problem with, I understood there was a problem with the ordinance and I fully support that um, we look at the ordinance to see if we should fix it, uh, we should amend it um, to cover it, uh, cooperative housing. But in the meantime, um, this should follow the inclusionary, inclusionary housing ordinance and I will support this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council member comments? So we're voting on the amendment now. Uh, for the developer to provide a 300,000 cash in lieu for the inclusionary housing ordinance. And it seemed that there's an addition to that to provide either $300,000 cash in lieu or to meet the other requirements of the inclusionary housing ordinance before permits are pulled. Is that clear to everyone? All right, all in favor? What? So voting on the uh, amendment and then we'll go back to voting on um, the original motion of supporting or not supporting based on what is presented without the amendment. So we'll have two votes. Okay, let's make this a three hour <laughs> hearing. I, I just want to say, we get these a week in advance and it was clear in the memo that they weren't going to comply with the, the inclusionary housing ordinance. So everybody had a chance to submit amendments in advance. And ask questions. That's all I'm saying. So we're back to the vote of the amendment to include a 300,000 cash and lieu 
or to meet the inclusionary housing ordinance. This is what we're voting on now. All in favor? We will have to have to go and do this. It's not going to be unanimous. All in favor? Opposed? Roll call, please. Cohen? No. Hinkle? Yes. Jazerski? Yes. Leslie? Yes. Lim? Yes. Lindstedt? Yes. Marsh Holshin? Yes. Schaap? No. Ward? Yes. Anderson? No. That passes seven to three. So now we'll vote on the ordinance as amended. I'm sorry, the resolution as amended. Thank you. I'm surprised I even can follow anymore. Um, <laughs> this is like the longest hearing ever. Um, okay, so I forgot what the or do we have to read the ordinance again now from two hours ago? No, the, the motion had already been read by the clerk in section 2022-25 as amended. All in favor? No opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you guys. Okay, moving on. Our next order of business on the agenda includes a public hearing and council's consideration of four resolutions relating to North Park McWinney Southlands, 160th Improvement, and AHV Townhomes. I'll now declare the public hearing open. We will follow the city's standard public hearing procedures as previously outlined. Council has a copy of the agenda memorandum, which I'll ask Beth to summarize. This evening is the Anna Burton-Zetti show. Um, she will uh, additionally walk us through this uh, item swiftly. Ms. Burton-Zetti. <laughs> Thank you, um, and good evening again, Mayor, Mayor for Town City Council. Um, I will do my best to make this swift, but this is quite a complicated proposal since there are two plots and I think four site development plans. So um, bear with me a little bit. Um, I could add the next slide, please. So the development proposal before you this evening um, on the second item is the Southlands neighborhood. Um, and this is part of the North Park development. The development proposal includes, as I mentioned, two final plots, two site development plans that include 239 residential units within the neighborhood, and two site development plans for improvements to segments of 160th Avenue and Sheridan Parkway. The project area is generally located northeast of Sheridan Parkway and 160th Avenue. As I mentioned, it's in the North Park PUD area. Um, it is um, consistent with that master plan for the community. Next slide, please. This graphic is depicting where the Southlands neighborhood is located within the context of the North Park. Uh, project Southlands is depicted with the red hatched line. Next slide, please. The Burnfield Comprehensive Plan designation for the subject property is mixed use commercial, and this proposed residential is consistent with that use. Next slide, please. Um, the first site development plan that I will mention is the McWinney and Baseline Metropolitan District plan for um, 160th Avenue. This slide is showing the general area where the work would be taking place along Sheridan Parkway, as well as the street cross section. Improvements include the road widening, the improvements such as the permanent traffic signals, landscape median, tree lawn, bike lanes, pedestrian walks. Um, this is generally between 160th and Pearl Creek Parkway. Next slide, please. The second site development plan is the improvements for 160th Avenue and includes the reconstruction of the roadway from what Sheridan Parkway um, intersection to a point east of the Flex Industrial Buildings and the widening of the northern half of the roadway from Sheridan Parkway to an intersection, um, I'm sorry, Sheridan Parkway intersection to a point just east of the lot of for the Flex Light Industrial Building number four. The improvements include landscaping, striping, pedestrian paths, as well as the installation of a water line within the roadway. The south half of the 160th Avenue um, is included for the grading in this area, um, but it will not be improved at this time. Those improvements on the south side of 160th Avenue will be phased consistent with the Managed Growth and Development Agreement, which I'll call the MGDA, um, and that's based on traffic and trip counts. And again, this slide is just showing the area and the cross section. Next slide, please. There's a proposed final plat, North Park filing number two, replat F included. 
Um, this divides 91.59 acres into 144 lots and 18 tracks. This uh, replat F also dedicates necessary roads and easements, and the area combined within this final plot is identified in this slide. Next slide, please. North Park filing number two, replat F blocks one through 11 site development plan is just over 19 acres, and it includes the site plan grading and architectural for 139 residential lots. Um, 74 of those are single family detached with 65 attached residential units. Um, this is the McWinney component of Southlands. Um, McWinney is currently contracted with David Weekly Homes to construct the single family units as well as Thrive to construct the attached townhome units. Access to this neighborhood um, is taken up Promenade Street um, and results in the traffic um, coming through this um, area. The ingress egress points will include enhanced intersections to allow for safer interactions with vehicles uh, traveling along uh, Promenade Street. The access and circulation for this development has been reviewed by North Metro. Next slide, please. This is the David Weekly detached units. Um, these are also included in the staff's memorandum. Um, um, the, I should say David Weekly is to the top left, drive is to the bottom right. Next slide, please. Um, AHV has submitted a final plat as part of their application as well. And this final plat would be plat lot one or 12 of McWinney's proposed final plat. Um, and this includes 100 lots and 19 tracks. Peak Street is the, it's actually North South Street, even though it's um, depicted to the side on the screen um, that divides these two residential areas. AHV is the intended developer, as I mentioned, of the 100 lots. Um, and they also include an amenity center within this area of the neighborhood. For both the McWinney and AHV, the parking is satisfied um, through two parking spaces for each single family residential unit. Um, those are on private garages or on the driveways um, for some of the lots. The, there's also additional parking on the streets. The garages are all equipped with 200 volt outlets to accommodate future EV charging. In terms of affordable housing, the applicant has identified a 1.9 acre parcel of land. Um, on this map, it's the green parcel at the intersection of 160th and Sheridan. This will be set aside for future development as, a, as for affordable housing. The developer will record a restricted covenant against this lot following the city council's hearing for this development if it's approved. The future affordable housing project <coughs> is intended to satisfy the inclusionary housing obligation for the entire Southlands neighborhood and it is consistent with the requirements of the MGDA. Um, the facilitating covenant would result in a credit of about 85.5 affordable units, um, that's 45 per acre um, for the 1.9 acre lot. And this is consistent, as I mentioned, with the methodology that had been negotiated with the MGDA. And it's consistent with what has been done in prior, uh, prior neighborhoods within North Park. In terms of public land, again, the North Park overall PUD as well as the MGDA have obligations and triggers requiring public land dedication improvements throughout the, the overall subdivision, um, as well as public lands within the neighborhoods themselves, as included in the site development plan. The schools, um, the proposed development is located within the Adams 12 school district. Adams 12 has reviewed the proposed development and provided Broomfield with a letter of no objection for this um, project. Next slide, please. This is the AHV community center that I mentioned. Um, it has a farmhouse style. This is at the upper left, the bottom right are the paired homes. Um, both of these feature a modern farmhouse style with some steep roofs and color schemes that are modern but intended to complement uh, natural colors within Colorado. All of the architecture I should mention, as well as the plans have been reviewed by the North Park DRC. Next slide, please. Uh, the staff memorandum included information regarding proximity to plugged and abandoned well sites that were within 1,320 feet of the site boundary. There are necessary um, workover easements that are included in the final plats. The, clo the closest plugged and abandoned well is 162 feet away from the nearest lot, and the closest well, which is in pre-production, um, will be a little more than 1,400 feet away. The development um, had previously been approved through a PUD plan and has vested rights, which exempt it from Ordinance 2164 regarding the setbacks from plugged and abandoned walls, as, um, as well as the 
um, Ordinance 2156, which was regarding updating the setbacks for pre-production facilities. That would have required a setback of 2,000 feet. Next slide, please. <coughs> A concept review was held in May of 2021 for the proposed Southlands neighborhood. AHB has requested two variances as part of their application. They're related to signage, and the details are included in staff's memorandum. Two neighborhood meetings were held regarding this project. The first in May of 2021 was regarding overall Southlands, um, as well as a second neighborhood meeting taking place in July for the 160th Avenue and Sheridan Parkway improvements. Um, there were uh, no residents that attended either of those meetings. Staff has not identified any key issues with this proposal, and that concludes staff's presentation this evening. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bertinetti. Next is the applicant presentation. Just as we ask staff to keep their presentations brief, I ask the applicant to be concise in their presentation. Would you please identify yourself for the record? Good evening, Kyle Barris, General Manager of the Quiddy's Baseline Project. So thank you all uh, very much for the opportunity to present. Thank you, Ms. Bernzetti, for a very concise and comprehensive um, uh, understanding of this uh, several projects, actually. Next slide, please. So what I wanted to do before uh, sending it over to uh, one of my colleagues is just give a very brief overview of the project to set some context. So when we took a step back about, geez, almost six years ago to re-envision what baseline was all about, that's when it was North Park, we said to ourselves, what does this place really want to be? What is the North Star, the guiding principles of this community? And we settled upon the three that you see here, um, healthy living, innovation, and environmental stewardship. And I prepared to go through what each of those meant, but in the interest of time, I'll just leave that with you now. We'll just have to save that for another meeting. Next slide, please. Contextually, this shows all of baseline with where we anticipate development to go over the course of, geez, at least a decade, maybe even two. And you can see the Southlands, which is identified in the red hatch on the, um, on the map here. And really the points that I wanted to leave from this slide, this map, is that the Southlands is essentially the continuation of a certain residential typology that we've already established with our West Village neighborhood and our Parkside neighborhood. And the feature of that is really a more urban form of living, higher densities, and then a whole variety of different product types, because we think that is better to meet the market by having more available. So included in our product types are uh, townhomes, paired homes, um, high density single family detached, apartments, built for rent, affordable housing, or even pursuing condominium developers for, um, for the next uh, few phases of residential. The second thing I wanted to leave uh, with council is some larger context that were not just residential. So the areas that you see, Project Sycamore, Last Mile Distribution Center, 160th Street District, we have our sex, <laughs> excuse me, I'm not sure that came from. We have our <laughs> next, oh, sorry. next Black's office building, which is just to the right of the purple one you see there. We anticipate two additional flex office buildings, um, industrial office buildings, breaking ground, hopefully this year. What we're really excited about is that we are also working to do a master plan for our Center Street ditch District, which is the area you see in red. That is our true mixed use area, which will be a variety of residential, commercial, retail, restaurants. We think that's really gonna give our community the there there that it needs. Um, so again, real quickly, that was the context. At this point, I want to hand it over to uh, Jared Carlin with North Design, who's going to walk through some of the specifics. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mayor and City Council. It's great to see you this evening. Um, Jared Carlin with North Design, 1101 Bannock Street in Denver. Uh, thank you, Anna and Brian, for all your help so far getting through the process on this complicated project. I'll try not to repeat too much of what Anna went through. Uh, we have some other some newer things that uh, we can show you as we go through the presentation. I'll try to keep it brief. Um, next slide, please. So this is the, the full Southlands neighborhood um, all together in one. Uh, 
and we're excited about it and it's going to be a great addition to um, an extension of the baseline community um, from a walkability standpoint and all the great things that we have going on in the previous um, neighborhoods that we've been working on. Um, we've uh, worked really hard with the DRC through the process, as Lena said, um, to get where we are to you uh, and showing all the exciting stuff um, in the presentation this evening. Next slide, please. So the first part, um, kind of dividing it up, um, the first part would be the McWinney Southlands piece um, on the eastern side of the Southlands neighborhood. Next slide, please. This is the illustrative site plan. Um, it consists of attached and detached homes all fronting local um, garden ways. Um, we have lots of enhanced crossings that lead to the future linear park to the east, which is on the bottom of the screen there, and strong pedestrian movement throughout. The darker color lots um, are the single family attached and the lighter color of the single family um, detached. One of the things that we're really excited about is um, in addition to some of the other things that have been mentioned from a um, sustainability standpoint is our HERS ratings. The code is north of about 80 requirement, energy stars about 70, and um, we're gonna be in the neighborhood of 40, which is really sustainable. And, um, we're proud of that. Next slide, please. Here's an example of one of the garden ways, the most central garden way, in fact. Um, in connected garden way that leads into the park um, to the east. Um, homes front onto common landscape areas and uses like this, um, providing pedestrian access to the east and west um, with sidewalks um, from the HV clubhouse that we'll show you here in a little bit um, in a large community park, like I mentioned. Um, it, it helps foster the pollinator habitat that we've already um, talked about and have shown in the previous neighborhoods. Uh, with raised planters, um, glow walks, like uh, kind of glow walks from the sun, with like a little pigment in the sidewalks, which would be kind of fun, movable furniture, that kind of stuff. Um, lots of places to gather with your neighbors. Next slide, please. Here's another one of the garden ways, a shorter, more mid block connection uh, with open lawn, uh, pollinator gardens, places to sit. Next slide, please. These are the um, David single family detached David weekly renderings. Um, and these have already been approved within the baseline West Village and are two story uh, multiple layouts, which have all are alley loaded. Um, have architectural forms and material selections are intended to reflect and celebrate, celebrate the rich agricultural heritage um, within the surrounding community. Traditional barn and farmhouse designs are combined with modern architecture elements to create a fresh and functional interpretation of the classic. Rural vernacular. Next slide, please. Kind of a, an interesting shot of the Thrive, Thrive Townhome renderings, um, which were also approved in the West Village. Uh, there are three story units with varying combinations, all of which um, as well are highly loaded. Um, the Thrive Townhomes feature simple modern architecture that unifies the buildings, creating an uncluttered and calming streetscape. The elevation features simple. And clean lines, as you can see, large expansive windows, decks on the second floor to provide um, additional private outdoor open space. Next slide, please. And the second part of this is moving to the west, um, just a little bit as the HV Southlands Grayson community. Next slide, please. And this is that plan. You can see the community we just talked about in the lower part of it. Um, these are four rent paired homes fronting on a peak street or garden ways. The garden ways um, are catered toward pedestrian connectivity as well and meant to be an extension of the front yards to create a sense of community in place while integrating on that landscape and to create cohesive planting design. The actual corridors um, are actually wider than they look in plan as the, each home had usable front yards um, that are shown in the rendering as, as well. Uh, the modern forms are mixed with natural planting schemes and pollinator friendly plant species throughout to respect the heritage of the surrounding area as well. Next slide, please. This is the HV amenity building renderings. Um, it's designed in a modern farmhouse style with steeply pitched roofs, as you can see, gable forms, urban contemporary details, including contrast, contrast and color schemes. Um, inside that building there on the screen um, in the amenity center for the future residents um, includes leasing offices, a conference room, clubhouse, or club room, kitchen, fitness room, restrooms, a dog wash, maintenance and pool equipment room. Next slide, please. And then this is that outdoor amenity area on the backside of the clubhouse featuring a swimming pool spa, two lawn areas, a fire pit, grilling area, bocce ball, all kinds of fun stuff. Um, will be a fantastic amenity for the residents to utilize. And you know, there's also the connection to 
shared in the sidewalk connection on the upper left side um, that we're excited to have that added connectivity to share it. Next slide, please. Also worked uh, a bunch um, on with the elevations and the renderings with uh, the DRC. Um, um, the pair of home elevation styles include two uh, variations of the modern farmhouse aesthetic, um, combining both variations on um, steeply pitched roofs and colors, and material schemes inspired by the urban farmhouse design trends, kind of similar to some of the other architecture within baseline and the natural Colorado landscape. Next slide, please. Next, I just want to touch real quick on what I mentioned the signage. Um, we are proposing um, and asking for a variance here with uh, with the rental community. And so two signage locations, um, one's, um, um, one single sided sign at the intersection of Shared and Preble Creek, that's the orange asterisk on the sign on the slide screen, and one in front of the leasing and amenity center, which is the green asterisk. Next slide, please. Um, so first, our primary um, sign at the at Provo Creek and Sheridan. This is what it looks like. Um, and because this is this part of the Southlands is a rental community and because the signage allowances are fairly low, um, we are addressing a slight variance um, which increases the allowed height from five to seven feet and um, in the slight increase in square footage for greater visibility along Sheridan and Provo Creek. And we work closely with the DRC um, and they like the direction of the side is, um, the signage. Next slide please. This is that secondary sign which we right in front of the clubhouse um, and leasing center. Um, and it is also necessary to add in wayfinding since this community is integrated sort of within the for sale aspect of the rest of the Southlands area um, and now located on the Main Street. Next slide, please. And Anna already went through the some of the um, roadway improvements, so I'll try to skip through a little bit of this. We have some cool renderings. Uh, this is the Sheridan piece and the building out to the ultimate build out. Um, next slide, please, uh, along with um, the ultimate um, traffic signal um, at, at uh, the intersection. Next slide, please. Here you can see um, what they look like. Generally, it's an extension of the field of um, Sheridan, what it looks like to the north. Um, and so we're pulling that field out and we're excited about the appearance there. A uh, minimum eight foot landscape tree line, 12 foot nice wide walk will be constructed along the east side of Sheridan Parkway. Next slide, please. Um, and then here's the 160th Avenue widening details. Um, this project isn't prompted by traffic volumes, but the need to access into the Southwinds community and also the flex industrial areas um, that Kyle mentioned. Um, the access, access to Southwinds can't be built without these modifications to 160th. Um, so the SDP that we're um, proposing this evening widens roughly about a half mile shown in purple there um, east of Sheridan um, to build the ultimate two westbound lanes that Anna mentioned. Next slide, please. Um, and within um, this SCP, the north half will be built and reconstructed, as we talked about. Um, and this will require closures um, this summer um, for several months. Um, and so um, and that the reason is that we have to raise the road in order to get access um, to the areas that I just mentioned. Um, and so we're going to we're planning that the closures to keep all the local accesses open um, and access will be then from the east, um, utilizing here on State Highway 7, I'm sharing to get around um, and to make sure that the access to the um, community and those businesses stay in place. Next slide, please. And similarly to the Sheridan um, examples, here's what those would look like. Um, and we're excited about the plant material, what they're going to look like as you drive down 160th. Next slide, please. So with that, we're um, we really appreciate your time this evening. We're our full team is here to answer any questions. Um, what's on the screen there um, in, in baseline, which we strive to be all the time, is a place created for people who are social by nature who value experiences over all things, who regularly gaze towards the mountains and the Rockies and remind themselves that they live in Colorado. Thank you for your time this evening, really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Garrett. We'll now proceed with public comments. Does any member of the public have comments on this agenda item? Okay, and I don't see any online either. So we'll go to questions from council. Members should limit themselves to questions during this point <laughs> portion. The time to introduce amendments and state positions for or against this item is later. Are there any questions? 
We'll go with Councilman Cowan first. I'm going to ask the developer just address one question in particular. We received a lot of comment on was the six month road closure 160th. Um, was that a typo or is that what it really is being intended? <laughs> Council, uh, Mayor, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem. My name is Jim Nimchak, and I'm the Vice President of Land Development, McWilliam Real Estate. Uh, address is 1800 Wazi Street, Suite 200, Denver, Colorado. Um, the, the closure is actually five months, is I think what we proposed. Um, starting May 2nd is, I believe, the date, going all the way through October. Um, the main reason for the closure is because um, engineering term, and I can pull up some more engineering level uh, folks to answer this question if I can't, can't accurately nail it down. <clears throat> but um, mainly there's a great change that has to happen to the roadway piece. It's 10 feet up in the air. So you can't build a two-lane roadway right next to another two-lane roadway that's 10 feet up higher. And so we, the only way to efficiently do that and not take it a year or a half to do it would be to specifically close the roadway down so we can grade it all at once, do all the improvements at one time. Uh, so that's the main reason for the closure. Um, otherwise, we are looking at a significant cost increase as well as a time increase that would be disruptive to the public. And there's significant safety concerns also about the slope of the roadway dropping down from Sheridan Parkway as it goes down to the drainage way. Um, and how to make that safely work within um, a shoe fly, if that's what the alternate proposal will be. So we have basically signaled at this time that the easiest way to get this done would be to, to do the closure without length of time to be open. Now. So if you did a two lane, the typical road construction where there's a temporary road to the side would take longer. Well, it's also vertically in a peninsula. So 160 is built up um, really on its own as it stands right now. So you'd have to widen the roadway as well as build a vertical separation between the roads. Is there any concerns in terms of police and medical response with that road shut down for that length of time? We, we have checked with both. There's a fire station directly there with access directly off of 160. They do have access directly onto the Northwest Parkway. So that's an alternative route for them to not have to use 160. Um, as well, the Northwest Parkway also has a maintenance office that takes uh, access points directly off of the Northwest Parkway as well. Thank you. Sure. I have one other question, maybe more of a comment, because it said in the memo that the school district said there was no impact. And I don't see how in the world there wouldn't be <laughs> on Adams 12. If anybody's been in Legacy High School, it's to the gills, already has 10 mobile uh, units, and it's just going to get worse. Um, which is not going to affect everybody in the, in the community surrounding Legacy High School and the other schools. So this really is more comment just asking the Adams 12, but I'm really concerned about uh, the impact on our public schools with these developments coming forward. Thanks. Thank you. Council Member Ledley. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this came up, I don't know, a month or two ago when the proposal was to expand that industrial section to add some additional elements off of 160th. I'm sorry with that, the map is kind of hard, but I think you know what I'm talking about. You asked for uh, the additional building in that industrial sector, right? And I, I raised the issue then about why would you only repair part of uh, 160th? Why not go at least all the way to here? You're going to have to go that far anyway. And, to, to kind of quote you, you were saying, we, we need to do this all at once. We need to do it all inclusively. My concern would be, you're going to have to come back. You're going to have to probably shut down again uh, at some point in the not too distant future as this project grows. I would think that it would be in everybody's best interest just to do the whole thing right now. Sure. And I should identify my role with my group is infrastructural. So when we're talking about roadways, that's my niche. Um, so uh, one thing I would I'd, I'd frame out, I mean, we've got uh, four arterial roadways that really kind of uh, circumvent or go through the, the baseline property. Those four, four roadways cost roughly in a range of 65 with inflation, probably $75 million. So the first investments we've done with Sheridan Parkway uh, will end up being around 15 million. And we have to be very targeted and precise with how we address infrastructure investments. Um, if you had to ask me the next priority, is not 160th, it is Huron. So we have to save up for Huron Street, fix that, uh, and make sure that it's, it's something that operates for the entire community and that's the targeted transportation zone. So we have to be very uh, precise with how we 
target uh, these big investments on backbone infrastructure. And so that's why we're basing it that way. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, still doesn't resolve for me the, the issue. You're going to have to do it anyway, given the, the scope of all of this. And I understand it costs money. You know, there's a point where the money isn't there. You know, we have to wait till we have more stuff sold or whatever. But it's just going to continue to inconvenience uh, the, the community until you're able to get, you know, get all that done. And you're going to have large trucks coming and going into that industrial site, and that's a large part of what that is. They're going to be tearing up that part of 160 as because you're going to be increasing the, the traffic and the weight and, and all that kind of stuff there. So it, it just seems to me that it would be to your advantage and certainly to, to the public's advantage to get that just done at one point. And I guess they'll, I'm sure Kyle's probably going to be right this as well. Um, I know that the, the managed growth and development agreement is specifically targeted to address traffic volumes and the traffic demand. And so that's the other part of the equation beyond cost that we really do consider. Um, this section of roadway, if we would not have had to build the accesses on it, would not even be anywhere near the traffic volumes that it would require a four lane facility or even the expansion of the two lane at all. So, um, a lot of, like I said, we want to prioritize where we're going to be. I think Kyle, you had knows that. <laughs> I think that states it well. Um, I would just offer up that we've got um, in track costs for this neighborhood are $11 million. The off site tracks are $14.5 million to do the increase that I think you're suggesting. If we had the magic wand and could do it, we'd love to do all that infrastructure, but there are economic realities. That's an additional almost $6 million extension. So we have to be economically prudent in how we go about doing our infrastructure. Thank you, Mr. Harris. Uh, Council Member Anderson. Thank you, um, and um, thank you, Council Member Leslie. I have similar questions, but I just want to start with a uh, a bit of a kind of where we're at looking at this from um, represents uh, Councilor Lewis and I both represent Ward 4, and that would be the Anthem area. And this would be the most impacted residents. So I just kind of want to give you a sense of, of what I'm feeling and hearing up in the community. And this is we're talking about parents who go to PRA. A lot of homes are already up there, and 160th is in horrible condition. And, and you see, you know that this is a two-lane road with no shoulder. This is uh, questions, Council. Oh, sorry. This is Questions, sorry. Okay, and the um questions, that's right. Okay, so I will I will go into that um information later, I guess when we're in consideration. Um so it's very helpful to understand that that's another six million dollars. So it's gonna take five months of closure. Can we guarantee that that's gonna occur over the summer when PRA is not in session? Is that uh, do you see and foresee any type of setback that would um there's always weather challenges and everything else. I mean, the roadway construction piece itself, um, once the grading is done, is only about a month of time. So what we've done is mostly um, asked for five months just to get the roadway operational. There may be improvements that go beyond that five-month period, but to have it operational and open to at least two-lane travel at the end of that October time frame. That's obviously after the start of school. Um, but I, uh, you know, I'm not a traffic engineer, but I will tell you that most of the traffic we see going to PRA does go down Sheridan, not necessarily 160 in this location where the closure is going to occur. All right, I'm one of those daily uh, 160 users. <laughs> so I, I'm aware of the, uh, it, it is a lot of traffic on that road in the morning and there is no, there is no sidewalk, there is no shoulder other than the, the dirt shoulder. And, and I gotta tell you during some of this really bad winter weather, and this is not a question, this is a quick comment. Um, <laughs> there were cars where your, your tire, when, you, when they're plowing, it's like tires dropping off. I don't know how many times I saw cars just about crash <laughs> on that road. So it's, it's, not, it's not a safe situation right now. So back to questions. Um, uh, what, um, where are you at with the internal plan for, Moving, I know there's discussions of like a internal like bus route at some point in time that would take people to that hub and that I-25, um, the car was up in I-25 that it's not the hub yet, but it's there's definitely going to be a park and ride there and bus access. Or is there any plan yet for these residents moving in to get that um, like the shuttle or something going? 
Um, if you talk at all about that idea. Sure, that that is uh, for others on council. The idea is that something it's a little futuristic, but this is what we're looking at: an autonomous electric circulator to help. Because let's face it, fast tracks isn't helping us out a whole lot. <laughs> um, so we've got to figure out how to handle last mile um, traffic uh, movement and pedestrian movement within our own community. Um, that is dependent upon density, and we don't have it yet. So we could deploy it. Well, actually, we could because it costs a lot of money, but it would be not moving anybody around because we don't have enough folks living there yet. Once we get the densities and once we have places for people to want to connect, then yes, this is one of the mobility, potential mobility solutions that we're looking at in addition to the pedestrian ways, the garden ways, e-scooters. Uh, we are putting bike lanes along all the arterial roads and the uh, collector roads. <coughs> but that, that vision is still there, but it is a ways off. Okay, thank you. That's that's helpful. Um, now I guess I guess that would be the question of my comment that was leading into a question. It would be, there's a lot of excitement around baseline. Um, the, the retail and the unique dining experiences and the butterfly pavilion and all these great things to come and all we're seeing is residential. Do you have, can you give any indication of when we might start to see some of the center street district, some of these dining options retail, like when is that coming? So COVID definitely uh, put a bit of a crimp on things and it did give us an opportunity, however, to do a deep dive both in the high density residential in the Center Street District area, as well as retail and office. And so armed with the information that we got after this deep dive, we've given that to our land planners and we anticipate having a, call it a first cut, a draft master plan second quarter of this year. Our goal would be to have that in front of the council before the end of the year with um, transactions actually occurring next year is what we'd be looking for. And we do have, trying to figure out how much I can say, we are working, we, we recognize how important this is, not only to the baseline community, but to the larger area um, that it will ultimately be serving. So it is priority number one, quite frankly. I should also mention that we are looking at that 160th area for some additional. There's this hybrid between flex industrial, flex office, and other STEM users. And we are working, quite frankly, with the Broomfield staff and economic vitality to figure out if we can get some more of those STEM related um, users into that portion of the community. Okay, that's, so, so it's coming. We're just a little, a little longer. Okay. Um, and then I think I forgot to ask this question on 160th. Now, because we've talked about the five month closure and only a portion of that road being widened. Well, what does it look like? And I understand, I just might not really understand the um, complexity is the, is the cost. But once that five month closure is over and the future development and the future road improvements occur, does that result in any type of complete closure or can that be managed um, without any addition? So the closure here is really, uh, really only related to the conditions we're seeing in this section of the roadway. It's the toughest part of 160th build. Um, it is because it doesn't fit the vertical um, slope criteria. As you, as you mentioned, vehicles sliding down the hill is because it's too steep. That's why we're having to raise it. Um, that commingled with the detention pond that's to the south and also the drainage way that crosses it all contribute to the issue that is arriving at the cold pressure. So there's there's a few more circumstances just in the great change that we're also dealing with. There's a Levy condition on an existing pond that's holding water, et cetera, those sorts of things. So uh, to answer your question, no, we don't have closures anticipated for the rest of 160th. We don't foresee this coming on other roadway segments right now, not even here on at this point. This is kind of the most challenging portion. Okay, that is that is good to hear. All right. Um, and that is all of my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Lynn. Uh, yes. Um could staff explain? Um, I guess it would be staff. Um, in the special provisions section in 15.8, um, the inclusionary housing, um, I understand that um, if we approve this, then there will be a facilitating covenant recorded for the inclusion, the affordable housing portion in the um, southwest corner of, the, of what we're looking at in Southlands. What will the facilitating covenant say about, or will it say anything about 
the time frame in which the affordable housing um, buildings will be developed. Thank you, council member, members of council. Um, there is the, in the MGDA, there are tiny requirements for both the covenants, and I believe also for the timing of when those <coughs> units um, come online, and we can get that information for you. Um, but I would need to look at the actual MGDA to get that. Okay, that's what I was thinking was it was back in the MGDA, but I was hoping that I was going to see it in this section so I could get a feel for that. Okay. Um, in, okay, the um, has, this is for the applicant. The, I'm, I'm sure the applicant is aware that the project is vested and I, under, I read through everything, of course, I understood it already that um, the, um, because the project is vested, none of the reverse setback um, um, ordinances apply. Um, the project is, it says the project will be um, cited, that one residence will be with like 170 feet of a p &A well or something like that. And then part of the project, then the residences too will be, um, well, we saw a map within 1400 feet of the extraction pads in production. Um, so, or in pre-production now, probably in production by the time we build these. Um, the, our ordinance for the production um, notice uh, is currently, it currently passed first reading and is in second reading on April 12th. So of course, then that does that ordinance would not apply to this. Um, in the in the spirit, I noted that the guiding principle was healthy living. Are you at all concerned about giving notice to residents who live closer? than 250 feet are now recommended distance to PA wells, or what will probably be our recommendation for notice at second reading that people living within 2,000 feet of uh, an oil and gas development should have notice. Are you at all concerned about providing notice even though you don't have to follow these ordinances? <laughs> Uh, Council Member Lynn, my recollection actually is that we do have to provide notice. I thought there was uh, an ordinance, and I could be wrong, but I thought there was one that had been passed a while back. In the, in the 1320. Yeah. 1320. So, so um, and then relative to the PNA well, the good news is, is my understanding is that uh, Broomfield had engaged a group to do the once the soil vapor testing, and that came up negative on that. So that's um, a cause for some reassurance. Okay, can staff comment if if the project has to follow um, six. 16281 e as it stands right now. As it stands right now, there are some requirements that for the notifications. Um, it's actually, I also believe in the MGTA, it's duplicated there, um, but it is they would be following um, requirements for mm -hmm. um, 16 as it stands. Okay, that's good. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Any other council member questions? All right, there being no further questions, the public hearing is closed. Next is Council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2022-27. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2022-27 by title. Resolution number 2022-27, authorizing and approving the North Park Filing 2 Replat F, McWhinney Southlands Final Plat and Site Development Plan. Is there a motion? Councilmember Lindstedt? So moved, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilmember Hankel? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Councilmember Anderson? Okay, I think I pretty much <laughs> I, think, I think I pretty much said this already. What I was gonna say when it was actually time to questions. Um, 
I just want I just want to make sure I think you're hearing the sense I think I think you've already heard this from me now. So um just want to share that 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 great anticipation of what's to come in baseline and that I, I don't want that to wane. I want I want there to continue to be this excitement of all the butterfly pavilion, the unique dining experiences. There are people in the Anthem Ranch that are just waiting for these things to come and, and the Anthem Highlands residents are super excited and and, and we're seeing all of this um Residential development, and I know there's a growing concern. And I'm, I'm feeling a vibe and getting the sense that they, they need to see something more than residential. And um, and, and also, I, I think that we need to somehow get a message out to the community about these traffic improvements. Why the five month closure? I mean, anything that we can provide, maybe there can be a coordinated message that goes out to say this will only be a one time thing. This is how far it's going. Maybe some reasoning behind it, but to to help the residents understand and bear through that five months of closure. And knowing that when it opens, it's not going to be complete. There still won't be the sidewalk all the way down that we have complete, which is way better than, than nothing. Um, but I think that's really, really critical. Um, and that to know that it's, we're not just, just going to keep putting more cars on the road, but there's something better is coming. And that is um, what I want to share. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Bichat. Uh, thank you, Mayor. So earlier today, I talked about the uh, One Book, One Group bill. We read this great book called The Honey Bus. And it reminded me of the uh, pollinator corridors and the, uh, you know, the baseline project to the butterfly pavilion that we have coming. And so, um, you know, it's, it, it, you know, it, it reminded me of this project. And as this project came forward, there's a, there's a strong emphasis on that pollinator corridor. Uh, I'm not surprised that this is another great project uh, put forward by McWinney. Um, it's a, it's a good looking project. Um, my, my big concern doesn't necessarily have to do with this project, but what comes next? Um, so I was a little surprised to see yet another residential project as we're talking about kind of the flavor of baseline. Uh, and so, you know, my hope is that uh, we are going to see the Center Street District uh, come before us next uh, from McWinney. Uh, my hope is that that construction <coughs> will be approved at the corner of Sheridan and, uh, and uh, Colorado 7, that that building uh, can still be, you know, starts to go vertical uh, at some point uh, so that we start to see some of that um, baseline flavor you know, up here as opposed to just more, you know, residential, which I don't think is the, is the, really speaks to that flavor of what baseline uh, will be. So, uh, you know, I think that, um, you know, the, the pain point uh, is going to be the 160th closure on this. Um, you know, I'm sure glad this, this is happening during the summer as opposed to the winter months. Um, you know, in, in Ward 3 with uh, Councilmember Lim and I, uh, we dealt with a, uh, a street closure during the winter uh, months, and it was uh, very painful, um, just in terms of the amount of delays that can happen uh, with snow, with weather during uh, the winter months versus with the summer months. So it's a little bit more guaranteed that that project's going to stay on track and, and be completed in time. So um, I know that that's not going to be easy for the community up there, but, um, you know, I, I think that... Uh, We'll make, we'll make it through. So uh, I, I look forward to supporting this project tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Any other council member discussion? I agree about Honey Bus. I do. Uh, the bees really work together and get through it. We got through the 144th Dillon Road winding project. We will get through this, people. Thank you. Is there no further discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That happens unanimously. Thank you all very much. Now I'm lost. I lost my place. Oh, there's three things. Don't leave yet. I just like wrapped it up, didn't I? Sorry. So that was. Hold on. Hold on. We have two more votes. Three more votes. Oh my goodness. I apologize. I got excited. Um, <laughs> so next is uh, next is council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2022-28. Am I right? Okay, good. Uh, is there a motion? Oh, will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2022-28 by title. Resolution number 2022-28, authorizing and approving the North Park filing to replat G. Southlands AHV final plat and site development plan. Thank you. Is there a motion? Councilmember Angle? I move that resolution number 2022 28. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilmember Ward? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? 
Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next is Council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2022-29. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2022-29 by title. Resolution number 2022-29, approving the North Park filing number two, Great Platts C, West 160th Avenue Improvement Site Development Plan. Thank you. Is there a motion? Council Member Ward. So moved. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Member Marsh Holshin? Second. Is there any discussion? No. All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimous. And lastly, next is Council's consideration of proposed resolution number 2020-30. Will the clerk please read proposed resolution number 2022-30 by title. Resolution number 2022-30, approving the North Park filing number two, Replat C, Sheridan Parkway Improvement Site Development Plan. Thank you. Is there a motion, Council Member Hinkle? I move that resolution number 2022-30 be adopted. Is there a second? Councilmember Ward? Second. Is there any discussion? Nope. Okay, all in favor. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you, gentlemen, ladies. Have a good evening. <laughs> Let them, let them clear. Does anybody need a break before we jump in? Let's just go. Okay. We had a break. That's true. That's easy for you to say. <laughs> and I'll just pass it to you, MPT. All right. So we'll let our we'll let our wonderful helpers on the technology and legal and clerk side get us set up. Our final business item this evening is council's appointments to fill expiring terms and vacancies on Broomfield's various boards and commissions. Mayor Pro Tem Jizerski and I will help facilitate this portion of the agenda this evening. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd also bet like to thank all the citizens uh, tonight who took the time to apply and interview for a position at our boards and commissions. The fact that we have so many interested and qualified citizens is truly what makes Broomfield a great place to live. If you apply tonight and are not selected, or if you missed the application period this year, I strongly encourage you to apply again next year, as even calendar years are the main recruitment periods. Additional vacancies will also open as well as opportunities for other boards and commissions. For this evening, the procedures regarding the election process to fill the positions on boards and commissions are set forth in section 6.1 of Council's Procedures and Rules of Order. In accordance with these procedures, the process tonight will be as follows. First, nominees will be identified for each position. Second, if the number of nominees does not exceed the number of vacancies, Council will proceed directly with the motion set point. If the number of nominees exceeds the number of vacancies, council will proceed to vote using our electronic voting system. The results of each round will be electronically presented. And then finally, following completion of the electronic balloting, a motion to appoint candidates by name will be necessary. One thing I wanted to add too was that I believe that for, for someone to be nominated or to be elected to the test spot, they'd have to receive six votes, is that correct? Correct. I can't want to clarify that. So moving forward, I'll ask the deputy city and county clerk if there are any additional information to provide. There's no additional information. Thank you. Well, then uh, we'll maybe take it from here. We'll now proceed with the public comments. If there's anyone who would like to be heard, please press star three to be placed in the queue for comments. And there's no one online. Questions from city council members are next. Does anyone have any questions about the process? Council member Marshall. Mayor, um, I just wanted to let council know that my wife applied to be on the advisory committee for environmental and sustainability. So I'll be recusing myself from that vote. Do I need to um, leave the chambers while that happens? You don't need to recuse yourself, but if you do choose to recuse yourself, you don't need to leave the chambers, but you can. 
Do I see a, a stain? Is that what the better way of putting it? Or how's well, there, there's no financial benefit. Right. Um, and, and Council Member Anderson and I have actually talked about this. She's in a similar circumstance. So, yes, you can, but I don't think the rules mandate that you have to recuse or stain. But if I recuse myself, do I have to? Do I have to? You don't have to. Okay, thank you. Council Member Anderson. Thank you. And um, Councilman Marshall Hosham actually talked about this ahead of time that we, we both thought it was appropriate to recuse ourselves. So, so I will recuse myself from the vote for the Parks and Rec Senior Services. And I know that we'll that out. So thank you. <laughs> Keep you growing. All right. Any other council member questions on that? Fantastic. We will consider the appointments in the order listed in the staff report, beginning with the Board of Equalization. Before we proceed with appointments in previous years, Council has decided to nominate the entire slate of applicants for all the boards and commissions and positions at the beginning. Would anyone on Council like to make those nominations, Mayor Pro Tem? Thank you, Mayor. Yes, I would nominate all applicants on the 2022 Boards and Commissions Master Applicant List. Thank you very much. So for the Board of, Apple, uh, uh, Board of Equalization, uh, we have three total appointments to be considered tonight, two members for a four-year term, and one alternate member for a two-year term. We'll begin with the appointments of two members to serve four-year terms on the Board of Equalization. Are there any additional nominations? I believe council members have the links to the voting portal. So now would be the time. Are you ready, yes. Terry? Yes. yes. Good evening, Council. Please uh, go to the Board of Equalization link that you received via email um, and make your selection. Please select two. Sure. Everybody pack their patience. Okay, so we do have all 10 votes in. Uh, the two are James Matthews and Christina Supernant. Okay. Is there a motion? Somebody needs to move that James Matthews and Christina Supernant are front end. Thank you. That, um, James Matthews and Christina Supernant be appointed to the Board of Equalization for four year terms. And ask for a second. Is there a second? Council Member Hankel. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The next appointment is for one alternate member to serve a two year term on the Board of Equalization. And so we have all the remaining nominations. Are there any additional nominations? Seeing none, let's go ahead. You tell, you tell us when you're ready. So there is one remaining applicant um, in the pool. Correct. So under the rule, the board does not need to make those. There's only one candidate for one spot. So we will go. Can we have the name? I don't have the screen open. Absolutely. You have it's in the Mark Hickey. Okay. We will nominate that Mark Hickey be appointed uh, the alternate member to the board of equalization for a two-year term. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Is there a second? Mm, Council Member Ward. I second that. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you all. One down. Next is, next is the Advisory Committee on Environment and Sustainability, also known as ACES. We have 10 appointments to consider. You want to say this about Ontario? Okay. So we have. 
six member two four year terms, one member for an unexpired two year term, one alternate for a two year term, and one youth member for a two year term, and then one youth alternate for a two year term. The next committee this evening is the advisory committee. I already said that, it's kind of weird. Um, we'll begin with the appointment for the six members to serve four year terms on the advisory committee. If I may jump in very quickly, yes, just a reminder, um, Mark Hickey is one of those candidates who has already been appointed to the board. Okay. So if he is selected, that would require a vote of eight on the board. I appreciate you bringing that to our attention. And, and also, Mayor, Earl of Brands is already on our board. Thank you for that. Was there anyone else on that list that's already on the board as well? Good yeah. Uh, Shuli Steele, Shuli Steele, I think I heard this too. Those are those are duplicates. Uh, I think he is the only one so far that he, and he's actually in a hole. But but Mr. Franz serves on our board currently. He's on the Land Use Review Commission. Right. As is, I believe, uh, Shuli Steele as well. She's on the Land Use Review right. Commission. So being already appointed on a board, our rule is that in order to for them to serve on an additional board, it would require a super majority vote. The effort is obviously when we have more candidates than spots, we want to give the widest range of opportunities to our citizens. But, and we do have that case. So um, if everybody's aware of that, we'll go ahead and vote. But then how do we, Ms. Gilbert, how do we separate that? Like, because they were voting in a block. Like, how? Would you be able to tell if, if, if somebody did vote for these candidates, we would know if they got the threshold? Oh, I'm sorry. So actually, this vote would not make the threshold. That would actually have to be a, a vote of the board of eight. A, a yeah. affirmative vote of eight of city council to approve that person serving on a second vote. Right. Okay. And the first one is the first one. It's all over the first one. Then Okay, let's let's roll with it. It's, it's new. Um, okay, are we ready to vote for those six? Yes, ma'am. Please go to the advisory committee on environmental sustainability link. Place your vote. We have a question, um, you guys. Um, there, there, there was a there was a candidate that was an employee for this board that was not able to apply. But I know that there was also her son, George. Was there a rule about employees, offspring too? No, but I, I believe both of those. They're both employees. I believe both of those names that said Mark is withdrawn. Okay. Yeah, I think he, he might be an employee too. Yeah. Just recent, just like, oh, it's been employee. Brand new. Oh, wow. Welcome to the team. I guess you don't need to serve on this board then. All right. Thanks for the clarification. I, I appreciate you asking. Good catch. So now we'll proceed with our vote for the six four year terms. <laughs> And just to clarify, Council Member Marshall, should you are not voting on this one, correct? I am correct. They're not voting. Correct. So we're still waiting on one vote. Where's the music, MPT? Oh, sorry, I forgot. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'll read about this 
little small typing here. Uh, Craig Hebrink, mm -hmm. Shay Jamil, Augustina Fox Collis, John Boomershine, uh, Michael Wyman, and Alexis Marsh. We've all received the appropriate number of votes. All right, thank you. Is there a motion? Mayor Park Can you repeat the second name again? Yeah. <laughs> the second name was Shay Jamil. Okay, I have a motion that Shay Jamil, Craig Hebrink, Augustine, where are you? Fox John Boomershine, Michael Weinmore, and Alexis Marsh. Um, be appointed to the Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability for four year terms. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Captain Member Lynn. Second. All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is the appointment of one member to serve for an unexpired two year term on the Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability. So one member for, for an unexpired term, I guess if somebody left. Um, so are we, you let us know when you're ready. Yes, Ms. Gill. Appropriate that I vote now that my wife has already been. Uh, yes. Okay. <laughs> vote. vote on. Austin. Early. Mr. Heine, are we ready? Not quite. Not quite. Okay. Please refresh that link for the Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability and place your vote for one person. Where I feel like the air conditioner is on. <laughs> okay. I turned it up to 78 and it's still 68. Oh, okay. I'm going to go get my jacket. Okay, so we have a tie at this point. So we're gonna, going to pull off all of the candidates that got zero votes and the candidate that got the lowest number of votes. I like that. Thank you, Mr. Heidi. <laughs> I guess I only vote if there's a stalemate. <laughs> Thank 
It's been it's been requested that next time we do this, we use the ranked choice voting. So we have two years to figure out how to do that. <laughs> right. And and a rule of procedure change. Yeah. We have to do that rule of procedure. Okay. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> the vote is now open between just Larry Beer and Jessica Duarte for the one vacancy for the expanded term. Did you get that MPT? Yep. All right. Is there a motion? They're still coming in. <laughs> okay, vote is in. And Larry Beer has been um, voted in. Thank you. Is there a motion? Motion that Larry Beer be appointed to the advisory committee and the Fairmount Sustainability. Or a two year term. Or until the successor. Or until the successor is appointed. All right, thank you. Is there a second? Okay. Yep, another chat. Okay. All right, is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next is the appointment of one alternate member to serve for a two year term on ACES. Are there any additional nominations? We're voting for an alternate for a two year term. All right, please refresh the advisory committee on environmental sustainability link and place your vote for one member vacancy for a two year term. Oh, the alternate member, I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. well, this yeah. and, and Jessica Duarte has met. Right around votes for that. Wonderful. Jessica Duarte, is there a motion? Quick clarification. I think we have six four year terms. Is that one two year term, one two year? Right. Motion that Jessica Duarte be appointed to the advisory committee on environmental sustainability or as the alternate uh, for a two year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilman Michael? Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is the appointment of one youth member to serve for a two year term on ACES. And are there any additional nominations? I think we have a different link for the, for the youth. That's correct. It could be a different link. Good.
Okay, please open the link for Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability for a youth position. Voting is open. Okay, voting is closed in Kabia Chidam Baram. I'm so sorry. Even appropriate number of votes. Thank you. Is there a motion? Mayor Brokel. Motion that Kabia Chidabaram be appointed as the youth member to the Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability for a two year term or until the successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Council Member Leslie. Are there um, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next is the appointment of one youth alternate member to serve for a two year term on Hazen. And are there any additional nominations? Okay, please refresh that link for the Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability for the youth position for the youth alternate vacancy. Council members, as you're voting, just a reminder, these mics are super sensitive. So for our staff members and residents watching from home, um, the murmuring mic is getting a little loud. We heard for one of them. So make sure your mics are off. Just FYI, thanks. So we have not hit the six vote thresholds. So we are going to remove the candidate that got zero votes and the candidate that got one vote, the lowest number of votes. Please refresh your link to vote for one youth alternate position. And Sophia Pike was voted in to receive six votes. Okay, now I have a motion. I move that Sophia Pike be appointed as the youth alternate member to the advisory committee on environmental sustainability for a two year term or until the successor is appointed. Thank you. 
Can I have a second? Council Member Marshall Sheen. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? No in favor. Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Now wrapping up ACES and moving on to the Arts History and Cultural Council. The next committee we will begin with the appointment of one member to serve a four year term on the Arts History and Cultural Council. We have a total of four. So one member for a four year term, one alternate member for a two year term, one youth member for a two year term, and one youth alternate member for two year terms. And may I point out that Shuley Steele, again, the head of flight chief of the Land Use Review Commission currently. Thank you, Mayor. Voting is open. Please go to the Arts History and Cultural Council link. Voting for one member, sir, before your term. So we haven't reached the vote threshold again, so we are going to remove the candidates that received zero votes and the candidate that received the fewest votes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Heine. Please refresh your link and place your vote for one member vacancy for a four-year term. Okay, we still have not hit the vote threshold, so we're going to remove the two candidates that got the, the equal lowest number of votes again. Okay, voting is open. Please refresh your link. Okay, Jasleen Batra received the required number of votes. Thank you. Is there a motion? Jasleen Batra. May I put that? A motion that Jasleen Batra be appointed to the Arts History and Culture Council for a four year term until a successor is appointed. Is there a second? 
Councilmember Anderson. Second. Thank you. All in favor? All um, in favor? Councilmember Levin? <laughs> uh, any opposed? <laughs> yeah, Pat, you can be Next is the appointment of one alternate member to serve a two year term on the Arts History and Cultural Council. This uh, the one alternate for a two year term is next. Please refresh your link for the Arts History and Cultural Council to make your choice for one member vacancy, alternate vacancy for a two year term. Okay, and Barry Snyder received the appropriate amount of votes. Thank you. Is there a motion, Mayor Pro Tem? Would that Barry Snyder be appointed as the alternate member to the Arts History and Cultural Council for a two year term or until a successor is appointed? Thank you. Is there a second? Councilmember Hinkle, a second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you. Next is the appointment of one youth member to serve a two year term on the Arts History and Cultural. Correct, and at this point, you only have uh, one youth member unless there's additional nominations. Any additional nominations? Did you have a question? <laughs> yeah. So we have three youth yeah. from um, the ACES committee that, that are available. Do we want to nominate them? It's only positions to see, or how does that work? We reached out to all the youth candidates to see if they were interested in other boards, and we did not get response from any of other from the youth that they were interested in any of the other boards. That is helpful. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to appoint by acclamation. Uh, no, Madeline Karimi. A motion that Madeline Karimi uh, be appointed. Uh, to serve as a youth member to the Art History and Cultural Council to serve a two year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilmember Ward? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? Mm -hmm. All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. So we did the, did we do the one alternate youth member? We don't have a candidate. So we're going to leave that open. Correct, you can leave that vacant. Thank you very much. And moving on, the Historic Landmark, Landmark Board. Uh, there's five total appointments, four members for a four-year term, and one alternate member for a two-year term. We'll begin with the appointment of four members to serve four-year terms on the Historic Landmark, Landmark Board. And that vote is open. All right, uh, the four candidates 
that have been voted in are Alexa Holland Plum, Brent Phillips, Curtis Zinger, and Michelle Pearson. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, I have a motion. Yeah, motion that Alexa Holland Plum, Michelle Pearson, Brent Phillips, and Curtis Zinger each be appointed to the, to the historic landmark board for a four year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilmember Lentet? Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The appointment of one alternate member to serve a two-year term on the historic Red Hook Board is moved next. Right? Yes, and there was one candidate remaining, Robert Landrum. Okay. Mayor. Mayor. Uh, Mayor. Pro -tip. Motion that Robert Landrum be appointed as the alternate member to the historic landmark board for a two year term or until the successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second, Council Member Shell? Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next is the Land Use Review Committee. Uh, the appointment of three members to serve a four year term and one alternate member for a two year term. We'll start with the three members for four year term. And the vote is open for the Land Use Review Commission for three members for a four year term. Council members, David Nelson is on um, Board of Adjustment too right now. Oh, good to know. Thank you. Okay, so we have three in. Fred Weiss, Molly Goodenough, and Shuli Steele. Thank you. Yeah, I guess before we move on with that, that would require the eight person to vote for Shuli Steele, correct? She's, well, she's applying for the same board she's on. Oh, I'm sorry, this, this is the board she's on, that's yeah, right. Yeah, I think it's okay. We're good then. We're good catch, Ms. Nye. I like that. So may I have a motion, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, um, the motion that uh, it was Red Weiss, Shirley Steele, and Molly Goodenough. Yes. Um, each be appointed to the Land Use Review Commission for a four-year term um, to end March 31st, 2026, or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. May I have a second? Second. Thank you, Captain Member Leslie. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next is the appointment of one alternate member to serve a two year term on the Land Use Review Commission. Okay, please refresh your link for the land use re review land use review commission for one alternate vacancy for a two-year term. Okay. 
Okay, so we don't have the vote threshold. We're again going to pull off all the candidates that got zero votes and the remaining lower ties two. Okay. Okay. Um, I missed what you said because then I was talking to me about the honey bus. <laughs> I'm sorry. So we're again going to re vote the alternate. Um, it looks like there's going to be two candidates on the ballot in just a second. Okay. Okay, please refresh your link for the Land Use Review Commission. Okay. Christina Mendelson has received the required number of votes. That's it. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. May I have a motion? Motion that Christina Mendelson be appointed as an alternate member to the Land Use Review Commission for a two year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. May I have a second? Council Member Lindstedt? Thank you. Any discussion? We, we're losing some people. I don't know why, but anyway, all in favor? <laughs> all penny opposed? It passes unanimously. Yeah, no, Todd wasn't here, so that's to do a little pump. Just to be, he stepped out. Do a little pump. Do we have the number? Do we have the number, Jeremiah? Okay, good. Thanks for checking. Don't want to have to do this again. Library board is next, and there are six appointments to be considered three regular members for four year terms one alternate for a two-year term, one youth member for a two-year term, and one youth alternate member for a two-year term. We'll begin with the appointment of three members to serve four-year terms on the library board. Okay, and before voting begins, I just want to remind, there are two of the candidates that have already been voted for boards tonight, uh, Jasley uh, Batra and Curtis the Singer. And, and also, Jasmine Batra serves on Cultural Council. Please navigate to the library vote board link and place your vote. The candidate for the three vacant positions for the four year term are Dana St. John, Carolyn Love, and Julie Twist. Thank you. May I have a motion, Mayor Pro Tem? I move that Karen Love, Carolyn Love, Dana St. John, and Julie Twist each be appointed as a member to the library board for a four year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second, Council Member Hankel? Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The appointment of one alternate member to serve a two year term on the library board is next. I'm going to go grab 
a snack. Please refresh the link for the library board to select one alternate member for a two year term. Okay, so we have not hit the thresholds for the remove all the candidates that got zero votes and the three candidates that got one vote. So it should be three candidates left. Okay, please refresh your link for the library board to select one alternate member for a two-year term. Okay, so again, we haven't hit the threshold. We're going to remove the one candidate that got the fewest votes. Okay, please refresh that link for the library board to vote for one alternate member for a two year term. Okay, and Blake Eunice has received the required amount of votes. Thank you, may I have a motion? Mayor Burkett. Mayor, would the Blake Eunice be appointed as the alternate member to the library board for a two year term or until a successor is appointed? Thank you. Is there a second? Council Member Levitt. I second the motion. Thank you. 
Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The appointment of one youth member to serve a two year term on the library board is next. Per the Broomfield Municipal Code, youth is defined as an individual between the ages of 14 and 18. Council received three youth applications. And one of those youth applications is uh, Natalie Karimi, who was appointed to the um, Advisory Committee on Environmental Sustainability. Thank you. And that vote is open for the library vote, library board, one youth vacancy to your term. And Aiden Edgar has received the required amount of votes for the one year vacancy for a two year term. Mayor, I move this. Um, Aiden Edgar be appointed as a youth member to the library board for a two year term or to the successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second? Council Member Ward? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The appointment of one alternate youth member to serve a two year term on the library board is next. And if my math is right, there is just, well, there's the two, but one is on the board. Correct. There so are yeah. two candidates. So we'll vote. Uh, <laughs> okay, please refresh your link for the library board youth positions and select one alternate for a two year term. Library. Hey, and Rory Stuber has received the required amount of votes. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. May I have a motion? A motion that um, Rory Stuber be appointed as a youth alternate member to the library board for a two year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you, Mayor. A second, Councilmember Marshall Shouldn. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Moving on to the local licensing authority. There are three appointments total to be considered two members for four year terms and one alternate member for a two year term. And we'll start with the two members to serve a four year term on the local licensing, licensing authority. And that vote is open.
Yes, Council Member Ward. Um, so in the uh, links we were doing to view all the applicants, it says there's only two people going on this board, one for a four-year term, one for a two-year term, but the response is asked for two for a four-year term. Well, so I'm just, confused. I want to make sure I have everything correct. Well, my script says three total. It is correct. There are two members for four-year terms and one alternate for two years. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. That's a good point, Austin. Awesome. Okay, thanks for paying attention. Okay, and Benjamin Maresca and Teresa Brown have received the required amount of votes. Excellent. Mayor Pro Tem, may I have a motion? Yes, a motion that Benjamin Maresca and Teresa Brown each be appointed to the local licensing authority for a four year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second? Thank you, Councilmember Ward. Second. Thanks. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The appointment of one alternate member to serve a two-year term on the local licensing authority is next. All right, and your only candidate remaining is Cole Maxey. All right. May I have a motion? Yes. Motion that Cole Maxey be appointed as an alternate member to the local licensing authority for a two-year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second? Councilmember Schaaf? Thank you. Any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Next is the neighborhood board of adjustment. Uh, we have four total appointments to be considered, three members for a four-year term and one alternate member for a two-year term. So we'll start with the appointment of three members to serve four-year terms on the neighborhood board of adjustment. And that vote is open. And the three members are Larry Hardewin, K. Allen Orman, and Kurt Ofog Johansson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Yep, I move that Larry Hardewin, Kurt Ofog Johansson, and K. Allen Orman each be appointed to the Neighborhood Board of Adjustment for a three year term ending March 31st, 2026, or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. And may I have a second council member award? Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. The appointment of one alternate member to serve a two-year term on the Neighborhood Board of Adjustment is next. That is correct. The, the, the last motion uh, was for a three year term. We believe it actually should be for a three year term. Oh. So that would be alternate? And not by my motion? Yeah. It says three year term ending on in my script. <laughs> my, my fault. It does on our paper. Let's see if I can just. Yeah, that's what I have my script too. Sorry. We can do it again. It, it is a four year term. Okay. Can I have a, a new motion, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes. Um, motioning that Larry Herdwin, Kurt Obog Johansson, and K. Allen Orman each be appointed up for a four year term. That would be uh, ending March 31st, 2000. That's 2026, right? Yeah, yeah, the date. So I had that part right. Yeah, that was my. Right. So, so the date would have been right on that, on that motion, I guess, or until successor is appointed. Thank you, ma'am. A second, Councilmember Ward. Uh, second that. Is there any discussion? 
All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thanks for catching that. Now we'll move on to the appointment of one alternate member for a two year term on the neighborhood board of adjustment. Please refresh your link for the neighborhood board of adjustment vote. Devin Fox received the appropriate amount of votes. Thank you. Is there a motion, Mayor Pro Tem? Yes, motion that Devin Fox be appointed as an alternate member to the Neighborhood Board of Adjustment for a two year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second, Council Member Shaft? Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. We're moving on to Open Space and Trails Advisory Committee, also known as OSTAC, which I will be saying. Appointments to be considered. There's eight. Four regular members for four-year terms, one unexpired term for two years, or an alternate member. We have the whole caboodle for two-year term, one youth member for a two-year term, and one youth alternate for a two-year term. The next, the next one we'll start with is the four members to serve four-year term on OSTAC. And three of those candidates have already been appointed tonight. Um, Curtis Singer as a, a full member, and then Christina Mendelson and Jessica Duarte were appointed to alternate member positions to their respective boards. And the voting is open for the OSAC committee for OSAC. <laughs> we are pending one more vote. The members that have received the required amount of votes are Renee Stavros, Tang Kang Bang, and Michael McLean. So that leaves one. We're going to remove all of the candidates that received zero votes and the one candidate who received the fewest votes for that final position. The fourth position, okay, because they didn't meet the threshold. Correct. Got it. Thank you.
We won't have to do this again for two years. We fixed it. We all fixed it. Yeah, <laughs> especially the gender of the whole weekend. Yeah. <laughs> <Okay. Right. laughs> <laughs> Okay, please refresh your link for the OSTEC four vacancies for a four year term. There are, you'll be, oh, I'm sorry. Don't vote yet, please. Okay, please vote for one member. Okay, we still haven't hit the threshold, so we're going to remove the one candidate with the fewest votes. <laughs> it's called wide open spaces. I have a big picture. I thought it was a toaster. Good check. All right, please refresh your link for the OSTAC board um, for four vacancies for four year term. Please select one. I appreciate. I appreciate. But I didn't want to. I didn't want you to have to scream over it. So my apologies. It's while we're voting. All right, we still haven't hit the threshold, so again, we're going to pull off the candidate with the lowest votes. All right, please refresh your link for the stack vote. Select one member. Space. 
We're just waiting for one more vote to come through. Lori. <laughs> it's not me. I'm going to get it this time. Go. Okay. Alexis Sweet has received the required amount of votes. Thank you. Mayor Pro Tem, can I get a motion? Alexis Sweet. Yes, um, Mayor. It's for the four year term. The motion to have Renee Stavros, Michael McLean, Alexis Sweet, and uh, Tang Kang Ving. Each be appointed as members of the Open Space and Trails Advisory Committee for four year term or until the successor is appointed. Thank you, ma'am. A second, Council Member Ward. Second. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Thank you all for your patience on that one. Next is the appointment of one member to serve an unexpired term for two years on the Open Space and Trails Advisory Committee. Guess what it is? You do it. Refresh your link for the one vacancy for the unexpired two year term for the OSTAC. It's open now. Sorry about that. So we have not hit the threshold, so we're going to remove all of the candidates that got zero votes and the one candidate that got the fewest votes. 
that leads just to candy. Well, that'll make it easier, right? Now we have a competing period, don't we? Oh, I like that song. You can be, you can be the tune master. We'll take turns being the DJ. You can be the tune master. Okay, you get part number. You can finish this off. Go ahead. Go away. <laughs> All right. Please oh. refresh your link to vote for one vacancy for the unexpired two year term. If this is tied, I say that tie gets to pick the, pick the winner. <laughs> This is his back. Yes, it's it's tied. Tied. <laughs> it's tied. It's tied. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, I have to break the tie. That is correct. You're, you're down to two candidates that are tied. Who do we have? <laughs> Dave Holstrom and Scott Whitmore. Can I, can I have a lifeline? <laughs> Hmm. Say the names again for me, please. Dave Holstrom and Scott Whitmore. Scott Whitmore. Is that okay? Yes, you just need a motion. Can I have a motion, please? Yeah, I motion that Scott Whitmore be appointed as a member of the Open Space and Trust Committee for a two year term until a successor is appointed. Second, please. Thank you, Council Member Shep. Um, any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. Oh yeah, um, we're in the we're in the we did the one alternate or no we're on one alternate we're on the alternate now okay so we need the appointment of one alternate member to serve a two year term on a stack two year alternate O stack. Space and Charles Advisory Committee for the one alternate vacancy to your turn. Yeah. 
We usually have a hard stop at 11, but I'm going to. But someone has offered them. I'm going to trust oh, that. Um, I'm going to trust that council wants to get this done and waive those rules. Sounds good to me. Okay. All right, uh, David Holstrom. David Holstrom has re received the required number of votes. Okay. Got that, Mayor Pro Tem. Mayor, yeah, Mayor, and David Holstrom be appointed as alternate to the Open Space and Trails Advisory Committee for a two-year term until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Do you have a second council member shout? Thank you. Is there any other discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. And we can jump ahead too. We don't have any use for this. Yeah. No use applications. Oh, okay. Well, we're moving on to parks, recreation, senior services, and noxious weeds advisory committee. <laughs> Practice. We have seven total appointments for regular members for four year term, one alternate member for a two year term, one youth member for a two year term, and one youth alternate member for a two year term. We'll start with the appointment of four members to serve four year terms on the Parks, Recreation, Senior Services, and Advisory Committee. And before you begin voting, I will remind you again that uh, Mark Hickey, one of the candidates, was appointed as alternate earlier this evening. And, and that vote is open. And also, Council Member Anderson, you're not voting on this one, correct? Jessica Milheiser, Stacy Klemp, and Jason Anderson. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. May I have a motion? Yes, motion that Jason Anderson, Stacy Klemp, Jessica Milheiser, and Yolanda Yeltz um, each be appointed as members of the Parks, Recreation, and Senior Services Advisory Committee for a four year term until a successor is appointed. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, I second the motion. Thank you. Is there any discussion? All in favor? Any opposed? I have to see it. The appointment of one alternate member to serve a two year term on crack is next. Are there uh, any additional nominations? We probably have enough. Um, so, one alternate two year term. Please refresh your link for the Parks, Recreation, and Senior Services Advisory Committee for the alternate vacancy for a two-year term. Select one. Yeah. 
Council Member Anderson, are you not voting again? Oh, I'm sorry. Welcome. We're just watching numbers. We want to make sure we know what we're doing. Roxy Jewell has received the required amount of votes. Thank you. Mayor Podem, may I have a motion? Yes, Mayor. Um, motion that Roxy Jewell be appointed as the last place here, alternate member uh, to the Parks, Recreation, and Service Senior Services Advisory Committee for a two year term until a successor is appointed. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. All in favor? Any opposed? That passes unanimously. unanimously. Congratulations. All right. So the Parks and Rec Advisory Committee did receive a youth application for appointment. Staff reached out to youth applicants for other boards um, and has the following update. Would you like to give the uh, We reached out. We did not receive any response from the youth by the deadline. Great, thank you. So, since we don't have any nominees, we're going to leave those vacant for now. Is that the final step? You can leave those vacant, yes. Okay. Thank you. Moving on. Next is personnel merit commission. We have five total appointments, two members for four year terms, and three alternate members for two year terms. We'll start with the appointment of two members to serve four year terms on the personnel merit. And the vote is open for the Personal Merit Commission. Okay, Mark Sicatello has received the required amount of votes, and we need to vote again for the remaining vacancy. Another member for a four year Please refresh your link for the Personal Merit Commission to select one. I'm sorry, don't vote yet. <laughs> Customizing it on the fly. I apologize for that. Please refresh again with the voting form has been updated. Just one, you're voting for the second vacancy for the standard four year term. Council member, let's maybe still see the, that it's requiring to just refresh the link one more time. Right, and Sandra Anderson has received the required amount of votes. Excellent. Mayor Pro Tem, I get a motion, please. Yes, I move that Mark Sicatello and Sandra Anderson each be appointed as members of the Personal Merit Commission for a four year term or until a successor is appointed. And the third person, should we do all three? The three are alternates. Oh, that's not wrong. It would be a good motion. That's a good motion. Thank you. May I have a second? 
Please refresh your link for the Personal Merit Commission to vote for three alternate members for a two-year term. Okay, Wanda Syed, Peter Bulmer, and Dennis McCormick. Thank you. Yeah, we're done. May I have a motion, please? Yes, I motion that Peter Bulmer, Dennis McCormick, and Wanda Syed each be appointed as alternate members of the Personal Merit Commission for a two year term or until a successor is appointed. Thank you. May I have a second, Council Member Ward? Yeah, final second. All in favor? Thank you all so much for your help with this. It went really smoother than I thought. Right? Thank you again to everyone that applied. Um, the clerk's office will reach out to all the applicants with an update and next step. Now we have the rest of the meeting, which should be short. The city and county's attorney report is next. Ms. Brown report me. <laughs> the city and county manager's report is next. Ms. Offman? Okay, awesome. There is no legislative update or any business before the Broomfield Urban Renewal Authority or with the local improvement district board of directors this evening. And there are no special reports or requests for future action. That concludes the items on the evening's agenda. Is there any other business to come before council? 